Welcome, everybody. And thank you for being here this morning, sharing this time with us. I want to start by uh, thanking all the organizing committee, because thanks to the effort and work, uh, this side event, the one tomorrow, and what you are going to see at the GeoGloss and Water Activities booth in the exhibit this week is possible. So I want to introduce Barbara Ryan. She probably doesn't need any introduction, but um, it's our geo director. And Barbara, the microphones are yours. Thank you for, for being here and for leading this. Thank, Thank you. you, Carol. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to the site event. Um, it looks like you've got probably one of the longest site events that's scheduled at this, these whole uh, two-day periods in terms of it running into tomorrow as well. Um, I guess what I would like to say are just a couple things. And you're going to hear a lot for those of you that are going to be attending the plenary also, is that you know we've got a remarkable community. Uh, there's tremendous depth and breadth across the whole ecosystem. Governments, participating organizations, certainly a lot this week on the role that the private sector can play in this. Um, and a lot's been accomplished, broad open data policies, GEO's been a vocal advocate for that, and it's facilitated a lot of work. You're going to hear, I'm looking at Alan in the audience, you're going to hear an absolutely phenomenal presentation on by broad open data for Landsat being ingested uh, almost like the Australian data cube into their national computer center, but Alan's using Google Earth's engine, 60,000 computers around the world. So regardless of whether it's one data center, 60,000 computers, we're now at the point where we can really look at some serious landscape change, and you're going to see that in this domain, in this topical area. Um, but, you know, we've got a lot more to do. We've spent a lot of time this last decade talking about the, the I, I say it, the adjectives in our vision statement, coordinated, comprehensive, sustained Earth observations. All of those are really important. It's on the provider side. What we've been trying to do over these last couple years is transition to the user side and making sure that all this information finds its way into users' hands. And so it's really building that bridge that's so, so important. Um, I think there are, and certainly in this entire water domain and with GeoGlows and all the associated components in this domain, it's immense. And there's a lot of challenges out there. So when we step back and look at it from a geo perspective, it's still water management, still one of our societal benefit areas. And yet we've got water quality components, we've got water use components, we've got groundwater, we've got surface water. And so we've really got an opportunity to do some knitting together. And it's not necessarily that one's got to be merged into another or initiatives got to be merged here, but we do in fact have to be pretty coordinated and integrated in that sense. And I think the next couple days under you guys' leadership is really going to be first getting a good briefing, good sense for the whole community on what actually is going on. And then almost like what we're trying to do internationally is to look at those interstices. Where are their holes? We don't have to have each particular initiative flagship or community activity duplicate itself, but how can we start looking at the interstices between and among them so that the whole system is operating a little bit more effectively? Um, and then I guess maybe the only other thing I might say, um, and we were thinking of, I was actually thinking about this um, last week. Um, I was out in Sioux Falls with uh, CS, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. And I think you're going to hear from them maybe later today or tomorrow uh, about they'd like to put kind of a one day workshop together where you in the room are here. Because when the space agencies come in to look at your requirements, they would like to see kind of a consolidated suite of requirements. And I think that is actually going to be a forcing function for what are the water quality requirements, what are the groundwater requirements, what are the surface water requirements, you know, what are the water management or water use requirements. So 
as a groundwater hydrologist for 30 some years. Um, this topic is near and dear to my heart, I can tell you that. And so, um, so I just wish you the best over these next couple days. And what we ended up talking about at CS um, over just a lunch hour is, you know, we, we all live in institutions, um, but at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to the interpersonal relationships that we form with each other. And it's those interpersonal relationships that help to build trust so that our institutions behave better. And so I think there's a tremendous responsibility on us just as people to try and break down some of these barriers so that we can have a positive effect on the behavior of our institutions. And I think there's no better way, uh, no better place to kind of show that uh, than in the discussions that uh, you guys are going to be having over the next couple days. So best of luck. Um, just having lived through a couple plenaries, um, I can tell you the side events are absolutely the highlight of the week. Um, it's smaller groups like this. You can be more candid with each other. You're here in the room focused on a couple different subjects. And uh, there's just a buzz that's created by the Monday and Tuesday going into the plenary, uh, which tends to be a little bit more administrative or bureaucratic on Wednesday or Thursday. We hope it's not this year. We hope we're changing it out. But enjoy, really enjoy these next, uh, these next couple days uh, inside events and all the best. Uh, so thanks. Do I turn it back over to Angelica, Adrian, or the rest? Yeah, thanks a lot, Barbara, for these inspiring and very nice introductory words. So um, it's my pleasure to be the first chair of today. So I will be chairing the GeoGlow session, which um, opens the um, this site event today. And um, Actually, because of the quite full program, as you might have mentioned, so we have to really take um, track of the time a bit. So we will have only rather short talks here, but the idea is that these talks will um, then inspire some of the discussion blocks we have planned for today as well, and we will have a World Cafe later. So, um, And um, Vanessa Allen from the Geo Secretariat, she will be the timekeeper here, so all the speakers, please um, <laughs> closely watch her and um, keep your eyes open for these uh, signs because it's very important that we stick to the time otherwise other people will not have any time for their talks at all so and the first speaker for today is is Angelica Gutierrez who will uh, quickly um, introduce geoglows or give an overview and yeah thanks a lot so uh, one more sentence maybe so um, in terms of time I won't introduce all the speakers in detail so just maybe use your first sentence to quickly introduce yourself and then directly start with your um, talk so I am Angelica Gutierrez. I work for the um, Oceanic, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, in, in the Office of Water Protection. And I am one of the co-chairs of this global initiative. So why GeoGloss? So I have here a, a, a list of many important reasons on why GeoGloss exists. But I can summarize it in saying that uh, the complexity and dynamics of the modern world is imposing uh, greater challenges to the political and economic uh, decision makers. And so GeoGloss is providing a framework and the possibility for those decision makers uh, to make decisions based on the best water information available and the most comprehensive. And I'm going to emphasize that word comprehensive. So that brings me to the GeoGlose mission. By the way, I'm going to invite you to later on take a look at the brochure that we have prepared for GeoGlose for further detail. So our mission, to connect the demand of information with the supply of, of information, but also to explore the science needed uh, to promote and further up the objectives of the initiative that I will be explaining later on. We advocate for open broad data uh, policies, and not only for open data, but to the right to access that information. Also, we help to ensure that the information that is collected on the national and global 
um, observing system is made available publicly and is also applied uh, in decision making. So that brings us to the policy drivers. As you see, they are not related to only water. This is uh, a set of policy drivers that take water in, a, in an integral way. We have the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, Convention on Bio, uh, Biological and Diversity, and so, uh, and many others that force us to look at water in a very integral way. <clears throat> These are the objectives. We want to strengthen the understanding of water data. We want to engage users and boundary organizations to use the observations, promote synergy among not only uh, the, geo uh, the geo initiatives, but also uh, other organizations outside of geo. But the most important, in, for me personally, is to enable innovations. So because GeoGlose cannot do everything alone, we have to leverage information and efforts from regional organizations like AmeriGeos, <coughs> AfriGeos, and other organizations at the regional level. But also then do, we need to do what we are doing today, um, working on the harmonization of geo water activities with other global initiatives within geo. And that brings me to my last uh, slide. The water strategy is the core of GeoGlose. And what GeoGlose is trying to do is to address some of the recommendations that came out of the water strategy. SEALS is trying to address some. In GeoGlose, we are trying to address others. But at the same time, as Barbara mentioned, we are trying to work together so that one feeds the other and we don't invent the wheel twice. I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Angelica. So I think um, for the first talk, we don't need any clarifying questions. It was just an introduction. Maybe for the other talks, we can afterwards allow one question if there is enough time. So um, the next speaker is um, Jim Nelson, who will introduce um, the working groups, uh, the working group on data dissemination, the community portal, capacity building, and communication of GeoGlows. Thanks a lot, Jim. Go ahead. OK, it's a pleasure to be here today. and. Um, uh, I, I represent the working group number four. I'm not quite sure why I ended up being the first uh, representative, but um, uh, I, I'm really uh, glad to be here. I, I know that this is a big um, activity and it encompasses a lot. And, and I feel I, I come at GEO really more from the ground up, having worked for many years uh, in the developing world, especially in Latin America in connecting people um, to these kinds of data. Then I came to GEO and found out where all the people are that have these data. And so uh, that's kind of my perspective as, as we go through this. And I, I feel like, you know, it's hard, I think, when you, we're in these kinds of environments to feel like we can do everything. Um, but I know that if, every, if we all do something, then um, united we can get something done. And I think that the the project, the pilot that I'm going to introduce a little bit represents that because there's a lot of uh, agencies, a lot of people involved that have helped bring that together. So in working group four, as was mentioned, we're on data capacity, uh, capacity building and communications. And when we met in, um, in Tuscaloosa in May, um, the objectives of our, our working group really were the harmonization of relevant data portals. And that's, that's a big thing. There are so many data portals out there, so many data. How do we begin to do that? But we know that it's important that as we try to get information to the end of the row, to the end users, we have to have a consistent message and, and it, or else it's too confusing. We also wanted to be able to better tell the stories that we have of success and a way to do that. So our goal was to start with the AmeriGeos portal, and I've asked Angelica a few times, okay, is there going to be a GeoGlows portal? Where, where does GeoGlows sit that way? And we, we need to be able to discover that. We're going to start with AmeriGeos, where we've been working already. 
Then the other thing that came out of it was to develop a global streamflow uh, forecasting service and collect the stories. So we've begun collecting many stories. You'll be, you can come to the booth that uh, will be here during the uh, exhibition and see many of these stories, the contributions of the different groups that have been involved. But in particular, uh, we've developed um, at Brigham Young University with the collaboration of ECMWF and many other groups, a new pilot on developing a global streamflow forecasting system from the ECMWS forecast. They provided on a global basis through their GlowFast system. We've been able to downscale that to watersheds of any size and now are piloting that over more than almost 200,000 uh, stream reaches and watersheds in South Asia, Africa, and South America. This provides a 15-day forecast every day on each one of those nearly 200,000 stream networks. But one of the serendipitous things that have come out of this is the um, running the ERA interim to get uh, put these forecasts in context. We have a 35-year time history, a historical analysis then on each one of these streams that provides statistics like daily stream flow and monthly average stream flow, flow duration curves that allow us to see what kind of water resources are available. This has um, sprung up out of an amazing partnership uh, developed with NASA Severe in particular and the other work that we've done with Amerigios and, um, in Latin America. These organizations have boots on the ground that can really help us get to the end users and know what they need and be able to get the data to them. Um, in summary, in our meeting, uh, we're trying to go for low-hanging fruit. Um, it's hard uh, to, to consolidate all that, but this is where we're beginning. Um, some of the things that we talked about doing this, this first year in deliverables was a, a survey and inventory and uh, being able to provide this global streamflow forecasting service, which again we'll be demonstrating at the, the GeoGlows booth and you can come by and, and experiment with that. There were many others there that uh, um, committed to providing their stories so that we can document and include that. Um, obviously, these are connected to the Sustainable de Development Goals, and water is a huge part of many of those. And uh, it's a challenge. This is hard. There's a lot of interest, I think, to harmonize activities. Everybody wants to do that, but everybody has their own daily, day-to-day -day activity within their own silo and organization, and it's difficult to break that down. But that's an important part of what we need to do, and uh, hopefully, um, together, we can be able to accomplish that. So, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jim. So, um, sorry. Sure, there's also some more here. <laughs> okay, so the next talk is uh, is by Jean Noël Tepo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Otherwise, please correct me. <laughs> and it's on the, WCM, uh, the ECWMF and the geoflows and support for developing countries. Okay, so I think you just have to put on this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> so I'm giving this talk on behalf of uh, my two colleagues, uh, Christelle Prudhomme and Frédéric Wetterhal, who couldn't be here. Um, I'm uh, not working on, uh, on GLOFAS, but I'm working on another Copernicus uh, activity uh, at ECMWF. And uh, my name is Jean-Noël Tepo, this is the right pronunciation. Um, first, uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with the Copernicus program, uh, so the Copernicus program is um, uh, uh, a, a, an Earth observation program uh, which combines satellite observations, in situ observations, and derives some services. Uh, we have six core services which provide uh, added value products. And uh, one of them is the uh, Copernicus Emergency Management Service, which is run by uh, JRC, and to, uh, uh, to which ECMWF is contributing. And uh, the one uh, activity that is relevant for uh, today is the, uh, the flood uh, awareness uh, system that is being run um, in terms of production at, um, at the weather center. So flood awareness system, uh, what is the need? Um, I think the rationale is that uh, there was a lack of coherent flood information and coordination in Europe. And uh, the aim of this uh, uh, European activity first uh, is to provide added value and transnational uh, flood early warning pre, uh, information 
two uh, number of uh, uh, authorities, national but also at the European level. And GRC, as the Joint Research Center, started this uh, in 2003. And uh, now it's uh, a full component of the uh, Copernicus Emergency Management Service. And as was said by the, the previous speaker, there is an expansion to global scale, which is ongoing, and which is called the Global uh, Flood Awareness uh, System, GLOFAS. So GLOFAS, uh, the mission, uh, it's to deliver probabilistic early flood warnings on a global scale using the best weather prediction tools available, and ECMWF is providing this, uh, uh, the, this weather forecast. It's to deliver a 24-7 service. Copernicus is an operational program, and all the services are also operational, and to support national and international organizations with forecast data and knowledge. And, and the goal is to serve stakeholders with useful and timely information on uh, upcoming uh, floods at, um, and provide early warning. So why GLOFAS? So this is the sort of uh, uh, thematic areas that are covered by this, uh, this activity. We are talking about early warning for preparation of uh, aid assistance, complement national and regional services. So we are sitting somewhere in the food chain. Worldwide comparable uh, information, knowledge transfer and exchange, uh, support international organizations, and improved data sharing. So the keywords <laughs> that were mentioned in the first talk by Angelica are also at the heart of, uh, of GLOFAS. So what is the methodology? It's to provide an, uh, an ensemble uh, system uh, showing discharge and return period, uh, indicating the severity threshold excedence, uh, the, um, uh, the persistence plots and freely available after uh, registration is, uh, is part of it. And the, uh, the project governance structure, it started as a collaborative project, and now ECMWF is contracted by, uh, by GRC uh, to provide uh, this uh, activity as part of the Copernicus Emergency Management uh, Service. Uh, the achievements last, uh, over the last uh, years, um, sub-seasonal and seasonal lead time extensions, we are going uh, um, further in, uh, in time. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be extended to 30 days uh, using the, uh, the monthly forecast uh, system of ECMWF, and the seasonal forecast will be launched in, uh, in November. Uh, it's um, officially going to be fully operational uh, at the end of next month, and then there are some capacity building and collaborations which are also ongoing with a number of uh, collaborations with major projects like RIMES or UNSCAP. One example, uh, there was one uh, in the previous talk. This is one case study about the dramatic uh, floods in, um, uh, in uh, Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. And this is the type of uh, products that are delivered by, uh, by GLOFAS. Uh, it shows that it's not perfect because the, the pike uh, um, of the uh, event was uh, not uh, perfectly forecasted, but it shows that the early warning is, uh, is really there. We are contributing to the number of uh, SDGs by uh, a good health and well-being, in particular clean water and sanitation, clean energy. And uh, the challenge which is recognized is that uh, uh, the collaboration is absolutely essential, and we are really striving to, uh, to do this. I will stop here before Vanessa gets really cross at me. <laughs> um, if uh, you have further questions after this, uh, this session, uh, go to the website and talk to my colleagues, uh, Erwin and Frederick. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sean. Well, so the next speaker on the agenda is Rose Alabaster, but we are not sure if she's here. So we, we didn't see her yet. So Rose, if you're not here. <laughs> Uh, if you are here, I mean, then please come to <laughs> forward. If not, we, we just um, jump to the next um, speaker, and that might save us some time for the end to have a few questions and a sh uh, short discussion. So that so means I have 14 minutes? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> that means maybe at the end we have a few minutes more. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the next speaker is Ashutosh Limaye, maybe is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay, and on the working group on science, applications, product development, and testing of GeoGlose. Great. Thank so you very much. Already yeah. So uh, again, my name is Ashtosh Lime, as Jim Nelson. I'm part of a Severe uh, program at NASA Marshall and elsewhere. Um, Basanta is here, uh, Basanta Shrestha, who is part of our Severe hub. He, he works for the institution. He's, he, he, he leads the institution, the government. Uh, he's a leadership position at uh, ECMOD, one of the 
one of the hubs that uh, Jim was showing earlier. Uh, Ed Begley uh, from Northwestern couldn't be here, sends his apologies, um, but uh, this is a, uh, he is my co-conspirator in this. The goal is to make the global data sets. Uh, following this, this talk is gonna follow exactly as, as what uh, others have talked earlier. Uh, global water data, to make global da water, water data sets available at the local scale. So um, where do we start? Um, start with, uh, you know, local end user needs, and then work with that to see what can we tailor from the global data sets, develop tools that can extract those data sets, make them usable, useful. And then if we don't have those data sets, specific data sets or specific tools we need, how do we design those tools, build those tools to help uh, cater the needs at local level? So it's a, effectively, it's a, it's a con continuum between a global scale data, data availability to local scale needs and how do we fill it. Um, so identifying needs, you know, so um, as Barb was saying earlier, you know, we've, we're trying to move to a place where we are catering to the specific needs of the end, end, end users. Uh, several if, uh, efforts have started looking at um, what the needs of the, of the institutions are. Uh, FuseNet, for one, is looking at how, what is the drought needs um, of specific regions in East Africa, for example, or the Horn of Africa. Uh, GeoGlam is looking at the same thing, um, talking about connectivity with other geo initiatives. GeoGlam is looking at what are the needs of the ag ministries in specific countries and designing these crop monitors. And uh, we, are, we, can, we can have a direct connection with the way uh, they, um, they work. Um, we also need to connect with NGOs. Um, and my previous speaker mentioned uh, there was this um, the flood in, oh my goodness, two minutes left. <laughs> I've been here five minutes. Wow. Um, my previous speaker mentioned, you know, so uh, so we have a kind of connectivity, potential connectivity with the with the insurance sector, and see how the how the flood forecasts to a two-week forecast from ECMWF, how they can be used to um, alert um, the insurance industry. So and start with uh, small forecast-based financing to see if people we can get people out of the way. Uh, and such. So what are the tools that we need to develop? So that is the focus of this working group. So we already have started extracting these needs. Uh, we've started exploring in Africa and Asia. Um, Severe has done some work. Uh, there have been several porters that were mentioned. Um, uh, FuseNet, as I mentioned earlier, GeoClam, uh, Drought Status Monitor, EWX have done significant work. Uh, Tethys is another example. Jim, um, fell, they, Jim did not quite go there. Uh, we have a session tomorrow. We have a talk tomorrow coming up um, by one of his students. Uh, that's a fantastic system, and we are using it more and more. Um, and th I think that can serve the gap well. So, what are our deliverables for working group two? Um, we plan to do a few things in the coming year. Um, write a white paper first of all, and um, complete a study for uh, how do we connect the water availability from different landscapes, uh, different. Um, land use change as well as climate change and see what, what are the priorities to mitigate the impacts and uh, develop an inventory of all the, all the relevant non-geo applications and how do we, um, how do we connect um, the current and the future satellites, uh, NASA, ESA, JAXA, whatever. And we are looking for, for those who, um, um, of in the audience who are willing to volunteer. We, have a, we, have, we are looking at um, a, um, a lead to, ta to, to lead the local to regional um, cross, um, you know, multivariate analysis. Uh, we have some ideas, and uh, I'll be happy to talk if somebody's interested. Um, again, food security is a, and sustainable agriculture is an obvious um, uh, societal benefit area that will connect directly with this effort, uh, disaster resi resilience, public health surveillance. Um, as Jim mentioned, this falls straight under uh, goal six of uh, SDG. Uh, there are several others, particularly two and 11, are uh, quite relevant to this working group. What I feel that we need um, challenge as a challenge or as an issue I don't I don't, I don't call, call, call it quite an issue but a challenge is to for us to align um, there are several aligned activities and we need to figure out how we can 
coalesce together uh, as an uh, if, if we can provide an umbrella cause, maybe uh, um, GeoGlow's portal, maybe the umbrella cause that can uh, enable these groups to um, contribute or do the work that they're doing, align the work uh, for a common cause. So that's all I have. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. If thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ashutosh. Um, so our next speaker is George Huffman on the Working Group on Essential Water Variables and Observations. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, continue with. Glad to be here. Um, I'm at Goddard Space Flight Center, part of NASA. I'm the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission Deputy Project Scientist. You know, bureaucratic, that means responsibility, not authority. Um, and I'm the team lead for the multi-satellite product. So what that means is I'm both a consumer and a user and a producer of, uh, of precipitation data. So um, as, as a consumer, I've had to figure out where to get data in order to do this multi-satellite product in the first place and the ground data that helps it. And so I've sort of been on the essential water variable side and observations. So um, the, this group three is, is a, an outgrowth of longtime work by IGWCO, the community of practice for the water cycle. And the idea is to establish a set of, minimum set of essential water variables and assess the state of each. And then more recently, we've come to the point where citizen science observations and private data sources are starting to be important. And then finally, but certainly most importantly probably, is uh, continuity in the observational systems and open access to data, which you've already heard about. So the goal is to make high quality, la la la, key water data sets freely available and easily usable. But if you don't have the numbers, you can't do that. So that's what we're worried about. So how do we do this? Um, so we have uh, already have surveys, and we will be doing some more surveys. And then uh, non-traditional data sources, basically there's groups that have sprung up to do citizen science, and we're trying to make contacts with those groups. Um, as with citizen science itself, that's a whole bunch of little organizations for the most part. And there is some citizen science stuff happening here, I know. Um, and then finally, observational system continuity and open data access is basically an advocacy thing writing white papers, trying to convince the agencies that we know what we're talking about, we have requirements and they need to be met. The governance is that the working group members take uh, responsibility for leading the various parts of the, of the projects. I'll throw this list up but not spend too much time be, thanks to the short time. Um, most of the, the list is a result of looking at the water cycle and what do we need to actually get the water cycle the only thing you don't see here is horizontal fluxes of vapor because that's not an observable. It has to be calculated, but pretty much everything else. And then the last two are as a result of working with the water quality community. We've come to understand that there's a whole new set of requirements there, and so that's an ongoing discussion. Um, and so what's happened as a result of the meeting in Tuscaloosa and since is that uh, we need a more formal definition of essential water variable and uh, sources and targets, start working with citizen science groups, and in general, continue to advocate. Um, for example, I wrote a white paper that went into the decadal survey that advocated for uh, continuing the constellation precipitation relevant microwave sensors. Um, okay, so here's what we hope to be doing in the next year or two. We need, to, we need to do this continued sharpening of the essential water variables on both the water cycle and the water quality side, um, look more seriously at the policy drivers. Traditionally in IGWCO, we were mostly worried about the sort of the science and, and operational aspects of the water cycle, but water quality is, is sort of a different beast and we're, we're working with AquaWatch, USGS, and stakeholders on those kind of issues. And then citizen science really is going to involve getting a um, um, subgroup that's more conversant in that than most of the people already on the committee are. Okay, so um, just to continue, there are at-risk 
essential water variable systems. I think it's a characteristic of observing systems that in general they're in a continual state of collapse. And so we're always having to advocate that they keep going. And then continuing white papers on various aspects, and I list them here. These slides presumably are available, and so I'm not going to go through all the details. Um, there's a lot of the SBAs that we touch, and SDG 6 in particular. The challenges here are trying to figure out exactly how to structure the water variable stuff. You know, this is an ongoing discussion between sort of the water cycle and water quality people. And it's a lot like herding cats. Different water variables, even just within the water cycle, are amazingly diverse in both the complexity of doing the observations and, and the state of, of uh, maturity of making those observations on a global basis. And so it's, it's a little bit tough to make sure that we get everything in the right place and make progress on all of them. So that requires a fairly wide community. So with that, I'm going to thank you. There's my email address, and I'd be glad to talk to people. Thank you, Thanks a lot. So the next point on the agenda is an, an optional point. So we had uh, Paul Di Giacomo and Jose Romero. I think Jose cannot be here, but Paul, if you want, you can take a few minutes to add some additional comments on the um, essential water variables. I think, did you have any slides? Or no, no slides. It's just, okay, great. Not too much. If you give me slides, I'll, I'll bust the rest of the agenda. So good morning, all. Paul DiGiacomo from NOAA Satellite Services. I'm also co-chair of the GEO AquaWatch initiative, which is for water quality monitoring and forecasting service. And George set up the, the presentation very nicely, I think, in terms of what's being done more broadly in GeoGlows, but then as a sub-segment of that in terms of what needs to be done vis-a-vis -vis water quality essential variables. And it's it's very challenging. George gave very apropos in terms of herding cats because it is definitely a cat herding activity. For example, there's the different scales that are in question for SDGs. Um, UNIP has articulated a full suite um, of, I forget, probably about 20 or 30 different uh, essential variables to meet the SDGs in terms of SDG 6 and some of the other ones. But then you have entirely different scales on local and regional levels, for example, in the United States with the EPA, in Europe with the EEA, in terms of what their requirements are, monitoring in very um, small local scales, all the way up to national and international scales. So the challenge is how do we balance and how do we reconcile? And that's part of the ongoing discussion between geoglows and the essential water variables. And then, like I said, with AquaWatch in terms of water quality and um, crosswalking those. I think, and this is an activity that's been done just for a little bit of history. Um, there have been many iterations of this actually over the past 10 years. I used to co-chair the Coastal Goose Panel, Global Ocean Observing System. Um, we laid out what we called essential coastal variables. So there's lots of different flavors of essential variables. And one of our foci for that activity was on water quality and pathogens in coastal zones. We identified some. There's a more recent iteration of GOOS in terms of the GOOS biology and ecology panel, um, which is also focusing on some of those essential variables. And then so how do we crosswalk those with what's going on in the water community, what's going on in geoglows, and what's going on vis-a-vis um, -vis the essential water variables? So I think those are some of the upcoming discussions we need to have. You'll hear tomorrow I'm giving a talk on AquaWatch and in terms of um, some of the activities we've undertaken, instead of trying to map you know, the universe of essential variables, we focused on a few that are fairly mature that we know users want, for example, turbidity, and looking at turbidity in NTU uh, units for those aficionados of, of water quality, and saying that that's something we can do via satellite, it's something we can do in situ, it's a global measurement, and it's done at all the different scales, and we're working to try to ramp up that. But again, we know that turbidity is not the extent, obviously, of the water quality uh, universe. You have to do pathogens, E. coli, fecal indicator bacteria. There's various contaminants and metals and things like that. Part of the challenge, though, is also what are, I'll say, relatively easy to make or at least tractable, me tractable measurements to do on a global scale. 
which is a different issue. And there's been a lot of progress made recently, particularly with some of the, um, the, the microbiological um, measures and to do rapid assays and testing. And then, like I said, going to the opposite end of the scale, increasing maturity on the remote sensing side, which is my day job. So, so I think that's just a little survey into what's been done, um, where we are now, and then looking ahead to the future, the increasing discussion between GeoGlows, um, between AquaWatch, between some of the other entities that are out there under the auspices of Geo, and figuring out what's tractable, what are the priority measurements, and then laying that out for the next five, you know, 10 years, and uh, probably with a white paper forthcoming. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. So actually, this leaves us now, you know, almost 15 minutes for um, questions and the discussion before we start with the next point, which is a panel. So thanks again for all the speakers. I think these were very, and sorry for the harsh time restraints we have, but I think it was a very focused and precise and very informative talk. So I think um, now we can use this time slot we have remaining to give you the chance to ask <coughs> some, some uh, clarifying questions or also to raise some discussion points or or give you an opportunity to have some comments on on the different talks to the speakers directly or to on GeoGlows in general. So please, um, the floor is open for, for the audience now. Are there any questions? Maybe we start with a clarifying question, if there are some immediate issues regarding to one of the talks. Any questions? Yeah. Please introduce yourself briefly, maybe, and then. Yeah. Uh, I'm Basan Dastrester from Yusimar. Uh, Bethman in Nepal is a regional organization, and also what Jim mentioned about, uh, and also Astros mentioned about the survey in the Kusmalian region. I just would like to bring some demand perspective or the user side perspective. Uh, now, if you look at uh, the South, South Asia subcontinent or the Himalayan ecosystem downstream part, uh, flood is a major disaster, major, major disaster. Even if you account this year's flood uh, statistics, more than 1,500 people died during the monsoon season. So monsoon is both a blessing and a curse. Blessing in the sense that uh, it provides uh, a lot of uh, people, population, large part of population depend upon the agriculture monsoon economy. And it's a curse in the sense that it brings such a disaster that not only it kills people, also lives, and also environment damages. So our experiences in terms of using GLOFAS in Nepal, uh, looking at uh, uh, some of the water sets, uh, looking at some of the uh, river system uh, in the context of Nepal. Now, if you look at the whole topography of Nepal uh, or you know, in a mountain environment, uh, the kind of uh, the observation is very, very limited. The hydromet services are very, very limited. So the, it underscores the value of uh, such a flood awareness system. So we are testing uh, this, some of the uh, models, downscaling to water sets uh, in some of the basins and some of the water sets, and we are working directly with hydromet services in the government to build the capacity of the government. But my key point is we are also in, in the context of science, technology, and innovation, but how we can really use this in the government system in the national system so that it can be used in the context of the flood early warning system. So geo, geo glows and the GLOFAS is a really uh, good system that we believe which can be adopted in a national system. So just as a comment that I just wanted to share. Okay, thanks. So any other um, comments or questions? Sure. So for the, the flood people, I'm just curious what the state of the art is with respect to dam and reservoir operations because it that's, that seems like the flood people I know have really yeah, they do really well with natural flows and they get to regulate it. It's just a mess. And so I'm curious, are we getting the data? Is there a prospect for getting data about dam operations? I think it's three panelists. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? I think we can also... Uh, well, uh, just yeah. to tag back on what he, this question was, uh, just for, you know, in, in, at times uh, when you do have uh, major floods, like what Basanta was talking about, 
unless we have a massive dam like Hoover Dam, it really doesn't matter. So yes, there will be a timing shift a little bit to the left or to the right. You know, you, we will. We, I, I believe we don't have to um, worry too much about the, the release schedule because the dam operators are going to be just as worried as the people downstream are. Sure, I, that's just my take. So uh, my 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 take is ignore the dams and <laughs> continue as if it's a natural system. Any opposing thoughts? Jim. No, I won't oppose that. I, I wish uh, I have a colleague coming from the Dominican Republic that we've worked with, and they have the struggle that, you know, one of the challenges they have is that the energy companies often operate the dams, and they have a motivation to keep the dam full, but the, the hydrologic hydromet services warning the emergency management people have <coughs> the motivation to, to reduce the, the level, and uh, so having tools to accurately predict is really important because they want to have confidence that if they're going to predict the flood, the, the energy people are, are willing to release water so just to the for flood center. storage um, and, and not be compromised that way. But I will also add, and you know, I've worked with Basanta in, in, in Nepal, and I know he doesn't represent a hydromet agency, but one of the things that I think would be really valuable from the NASA's, the NOAA's, the, the, the large international agencies involved in GEO that are providing the data is one of the things I believe that developing countries who need this data so much can offer is their own observations. And all of these systems are made better by having local observations. And that, to me, ought to be part of the, the you know, whereas they may not have the resources to always pay directly for those services, they, they do have the ability to pay in terms of providing data that will enhance and enrich the services. And I think that's something we have to continue to encourage. Yeah, sure. So I, I think um, in terms of the time, we um, will start to already introduce the panel now. So the next part of the program is a uh, to have a panel that's chaired by Angelica on the um, contributions of programs and agencies to GeoGlobe. So we will have uh, three people on the panel here in the front. The first is a uh, Bradley Dawn from NASA, and um, oh, actually it's more than three. I just don't. I, I actually don't know. It's a bit more. We need a few more chairs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the. We have Vanessa Allen from the Geo Secretariat, um, Bradley Dorn from NASA, then Selma Chekali, I hope I Chachali. pronounced it right, Chachali from CNS, CNS, and then Tom Graciano from NOAA, Nagaracha Rauhachi um, from the World Bank, and Osvaldo Morales um, from Camaden, Brazil, and Paul Di Giacomo from CEOs. So, um, Presentation mode. Yes. That's the one you need. No, this is the only slide that we are going to use. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then we don't need it because you're blinding your panel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Selma. Um, Take a photo, turn it on. Okay. Well, I need to. Okay. No, 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 you'll be blinded. Yes. yes. Thank you, Peter. Oh, perfect. Well done, Peter. Okay, so I want to start by thanking you, each one of you for being here. And uh, yesterday, when I was looking at, you know, what is the meaning of contribution? So it, I found something that says, you know, it's something that somebody or an entity does to further or to advance something else. In our case, it will be what are the organizations uh, doing or what are their contributions to advance GeoGloss? And so that's why I had uh, the objectives of GeoClose. And so I'm going to go through very quickly. Strengthening the understanding of water data 
engage end users and boundary organizations to understand needs, promote the synergy <laughs> among activities, support awareness, strengthening capacity building, facilitate professional networking, contribute to the assessment of population and economic growth impacts on water resources availability and climate change to inform planning and adaptation activities, improve public domain access to water sustainability related data, and enable innovation. <laughs> so um, if anyone want to take the first So, so if I could start, um, again, Paul Giacomo set a very high level here representing CIOS Committee on Earth Observation of Satellites. So CIOS is an international organization and again built of most of the, uh, the principal sat Earth Observing Satellite Agencies. Um, it's been around for several decades and the, the bottom line is water and the activities that GeoGlows are doing are very important and a very high profile discussion within CIOS right now, just particularly for example, in the last few months, Selma gave a talk in Frascati a couple months ago this past last week in uh, Rapid City, hosted by USGS, the CIOS Plenary Met, and there was a, a water workshop. And so, point being that the satellite, the space agencies are taking this topic very seriously, particularly from a critical time in terms of what users need and some of the, the different challenges and uh, crises that we've Long heard enough. about. And so what CIOS is doing, so there's both programmatic steps as well as scientific steps. There's the, the GIOS water strategy that came out, and then there's the GeoGlows activities. I have a big mouth, but I'll use this anyway. Um, so there was a CIOS response to that and working active, actively with Angelica and Rick and, and other folks like that. And more recently, it's a question of, of how does CIOS bring to bear its capabilities in support of GeoGlows and the GIOS water strategy. Um, I won't get into too much detail, but just tell you a little bit about how CIOS is constructed. For one thing, are there are these entity called the CIOS virtual constellations that focus on different parameters. There is a precipitation one. Um, there's a land imaging one. There's an ocean color one and several others that relate to water, okay? And so, so those are going to be a principal component in terms of how CIOS contributes to GeoGlows and to uh, the GIOS water strategy. Secondly, there's uh, working groups, technical working groups. There's ones on capacity building, user engagement, on calibration validation. Those are also to ensure that those high quality fit for purpose measurements are available for users and particularly for, for GeoGlows applications. So now the discussion is how do we work together, how do we harmonize those observations, some of the things you've heard about in terms of geoglows, ensuring those observations are available, but not just the observations in a singular sense, how do you do it in a transboundary sense, bringing together the land and the water and across the interface and likewise with the atmosphere. How do you do it in an interdisciplinary sense? Another CIOS working group is uh, an ad hoc group on the sustainable development goals. So for CIOS to likewise understand those and how to bring to bear these earth observing capabilities and in Support of what GeoGlows is doing for the water um, and for the GEOS water mission. So um, I'll stop there, but I think the, the take home messages are from the CEOS, from the satellite agency perspectives. This is an incredibly important topic, um, so much so that, again, making sure that folks such as me are delegated in part to help GeoGlows and to ensure that we bring to bear those satellite Earth observations in support of GeoGlows and the, the GEOS water strategy. Yeah, but maybe I talk and then I take a... Um, okay, um, hello, so I'm Vanessa Allen from the Geo Secretariat. Um, I'm coordinating the water activity, uh, not only GeoGloves, but also AquaWatch and um, other, uh, other activity. Um, I will not uh, stay long because I need to prepare the other presentation and I'm running between the, the photographer and, and, and anything. But uh, what I want to say is that uh, I'm very happy because uh, we are really going forward now. Um, in May, we had, our, we had our first steering committee, and uh, I can really see uh, an, evo an, evo an involvement, sorry, an evolution of, uh, of geoglobes. So it's, it's really 
going forward and it's really uh, encouraging. So in, uh, an, in my opinion, so in a, um, a point of view from the Geo Secretariat, we are coordinating different activities. So not only GeoGlobe, there is AquaWatch, there is Diaz, there is uh, Geo Wetland, uh, there is so much other activity. So what I'm, I'm, I'm happy because now we are like different actors in this room and it's really an opportunity to really discuss how to coordinate. I know it's basic, but it's, it's always coming back. In each meeting you go, it's always, oh, we have to coordinate, we have to, to contribute, we have to. So it's, I think it's really a side event for that. And there is a, a World Cafe later who will separate uh, uh, people in different groups and we can really discuss about how to contribute to different activity and how to, to collaborate all together. So I really hope we can really go forward in terms of collaboration. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. I think we'll run to the other presentation. But if you have any question uh, about other activity, as I said, we, you can always come to me. Yes, Selma Cherchali from uh, CNES, the French Space Agency, and the uh, uh, contributor, of course, to CEOS. I, I misunderstood, but I prepared a presentation trying to uh, highlight what are the activities which are conducted at the French national level. And you will see through my presentation many key messages which have been already addressed uh, in previous uh, presentation. So, I like start. I like start my presentation uh, showing this picture. We have never reached such a space content context in terms of space mission dealing with water cycle. The issue is that not all components are observed at the desired resolution in terms of spatial and temporal one. And as uh, Paul and other previous uh, people said before. The activities we are conducted at the national level and international level is trying to pull, to put all that component uh, together in order to try at different level of scales, global, regional, local, national, to, to have a coherent uh, key essential water variables at the right scales. And um, I would like to also attract your attention that we have also never reached such evolution in the space mission. In terms of accuracy, I just took some example regarding the soil moisture from AMSER E to, to, so, to SMOS or SMAP missions. In terms of increasing the spatial resolution, reaching then what hydrologists in situ are already trying to measure and we are also trying to attract the attention of this e new involvement. Increase in terms of temporal resolution with Copernicus operational sentinel missions and of course increasing in accessibility data. So with it national at national level, CNES as a French space agency research and development agency in innovation is supporting this dynamic by contributing to innovative mission, including the SWOT and the SMOS, which are specific dedicated to hydrology and water resource, but also to other missions such as Sentinel's missions and the Megatropic or GPM dealing with precipitation. Supporting research activities and increasing the relationship between research laboratories and water accents, actors. And we have many ongoing activities. Of course, I will just take some few examples in order to show you how we are trying to make the bridge, the bridge links between those actors and research community and the space provider data. Within an, imp an important program, which is called the SWOT preparatory programs. And we have already at European level now a Copernicus water and snow service in the Copernicus global land service, managing by the GRC and with the long-term sustainability, uh, including this important uh, component of water also in the Copernicus Climate Service. And this water preparatory program is trying to push forward the water resource application by having an approach which is a multi-sensor approach. Giving the first slide I show you, we have never been uh, reached the, such a context, conducting many research and development activity in close relationship with the act, water actors. Just some few insights and examples. 
Within the Nadir altimetry uh, history, long history and continuity measurements, we have uh, already at European level, as I said, a Copernicus service based on uh, ten, more than 10 years of research and development during the altimetry mission for rivers and lakes. Of course, uh, as a space uh, agency innovation, uh, we are also preparing the next generation, which is the SWOT mission, which will give us an unprecedented global uh, observations at the global scale. And from SMOS program, which is the dealing with the soil moisture, of course, uh, uh, we are trying, uh, uh, since its launch in 2009, to of course build the right information product information because we are not we cannot speak about water resource management without any information indicator products in a in a very qualified way trying to transfer this knowledge to operational services as you will see and uh, having of course a, a government project project structured at national level within the land data center tia so we developed uh, at national level a portfolio of products, surface soil moisture, an important product which is the root zo soil moisture which is ab able to make forecast for the draft, agriculture draft, within assimilation of the soil moisture within a, a model, draft index at global scale, a soil moisture at high resolution dealing with the regional aspect as I, we said before, and of course the water fraction on some specific area, here an example on Amazon Basin. And of course aiming to have long time series with the flood risk information. Just to show you some very quickly, very example. Uh, one an important uh, thing I would like to highlight here is that within assimilation of the space data uh, combining with EC2, uh, we built a fire risk monitoring and we proved that in, uh, for the fires in Canada last year with the early warning of uh, dry condition and fire risk uh, was uh, provided based on the root zone soil moisture anomalies. This is another example showing the, uh, moni the so small monitoring phase ma major draft in 2015. And uh, from the, the beginning of the session, we heard uh, many times about the necessity and the importance of bridging the gap between the space hydrology experts and basin agencies. And I just took two examples. One with the, uh, within the uh, uh, intensive watershed in Morocco, where you see here the, the importance of water for life, for agriculture, of course, and, and so on. And uh, we built in a nearly time uh, monitoring evapotranspiration mapping, uh, helping, uh, of course, uh, the irrigation advisory at plot scale, bridging the gap between the global, local, national, and plot scale. Within the uh, National Basin Agency Authority, uh, within the SWOT preparatory program, we work since 2014 towards a pilot site based on a multi-mission and model approach. And we had uh, many, many activities with them, specifically building a capacity building with Niger Basin Authority on the precipitation link to discharge monitoring for key uh, operational services for navigation, hydroelectricity, and so on. The same uh, pilot study was conducted with the, is conducted with SICOS, which is the uh, Congo Authority Basin, providing them it is the second major uh, river in the world, but no in situ measurement available. So we built a database based on Nadir altimetry, uh, building more than 500 virtual stations of the height of the Congo rivers and uh, we just uh, signed an agreement with them in June. Just before finishing my presentation, the rope map for hydrology mission is here. You can have this presentation, of course. But my key messages as a, a space agency is there is a clearly a need for strong international coordination. To integrate observation from global regional platform, of course, we have already heard that. But we need also to have continuity of the key space observation, soil moisture, altimetry nadir, and the high resolution. But also pushing, uh, because we are in close cooperation with the science, but also users, about a new observation needed at the adequate spatial and temporal resolution, precipitation, evapotranspiration, 
It is the, the purpose of the Sentinel expansion, uh, which is uh, uh, the discussion are already ongoing. And we need, of course, this uh, uh, very strong uh, collaboration, international collaboration, in order to integrate uh, all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Selma. Um, I want to, with the remaining speakers, I want to focus a little bit more on, you know, you have seen the presentation that we provided, an overview of GeoGloss. So let's try to be more specific in the sense that it's not about, you know, what your organization is doing. It's about how can you provide, you know, further, how can we, can you help us or your organization help us to advance those objectives that we have uh, shown in the, in the presentations, either on, you know, innovations or uh, capacity building, uh, services, et cetera. So, Hart? All right, uh, thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Harsh. There's longer versions of my name if you want. And uh, uh, I uh, have been at the World Bank for about 21 years working on water resources, environment, and climate. And uh, I think the question here is not what GeoGlows can do for you, what you can do for GeoGlows, right? So uh, in that regard, uh, you know, given what was presented, uh, there's about uh, three broad areas in which I think uh, places like the bank can help uh, in uh, terms of both uh, helping GeoGlows with its products as well as using a lot of the products from GeoGlows. Uh, and uh, these would be uh, in the form of the three I's we like to talk about, which is information, institutions, and investments. So on the uh, information side, there's uh, a lot of work that uh, different parts of the bank are doing, uh, for example, and trying to see if we can get uh, a better handle on all the water-related data that we can help our countries with. As you heard in one of the first presentations, I think Ashutosh said, there are lots of portals out there. Everyone is saying, you know, uh, come to my portal and look at my one piece of data. So instead of that, can we uh, try and see if we can encourage everybody to start putting a little bit more in the public domain? Can we create ways in which a lot of these uh, information can be pulled together and visualized in uh, ways in which it can go up the chain from data to information to knowledge to decision support, right? And hopefully we'll get a chance a little later, I see I've been volunteered for a couple of other sessions today, uh, to try and see some of these live. Uh, one of those is uh, an activity we would like to uh, call Spatial Agent. It's a free app you can download. Uh, and uh, we've made it now much cooler looking. Hopefully the new version will be up uh, next week on the, uh, the App Store. Uh, and uh, it's a good way to try and uh, look at all of the different data products that uh, many of you are producing and seeing how to get it uh, on your phone and uh, you know in ways in which you can integrate it in portals and uh, other forms. The other is uh, in terms of using the information also for the second eye for institutional development, which is uh, relating to e-books, for example. So that's something that <coughs> we've just introduced at the bank. Till now, uh, e-books at the bank meant just a PDF version of a publication. And uh, one of the things that we are trying to do now is to see if we can add interactive elements, such as interactive maps and lots of multimedia and other things. And we'll show you some examples where we've started working with uh, NASA and others, for example, to make an e-book on Earth observation for water resources, as well as now we are doing other versions for looking at in situ monitoring and a whole range of uh, other uh, uh, primer for different types of spatial data and so on. And we'd like to work with all of you on these kinds of products, because we consider these to be living products that will keep getting updated uh, based on the new clever stuff that all of us are working on. Uh, and uh, related to that, on the institutional side, we'd also like to see if we can uh, explore using our new platform, which is the open learning campus that we have at the bank, to try and see, uh, it's like a Coursera or edX, but aimed at development professionals and uh, governments, to try and see how we can use those to uh, get uh, better packaging of knowledge, whether it's in the form of e-books or webinars or MOOCs or other things, to look at all the, the, the clever people working 
on different aspects, but make it better related to uh, the governments that we are working with. At the bank, we have about 16,000 people in about uh, 130 plus offices around the world. So can we use also our video conference network? Can we use the fact that we have people in every office that know people by first name in each of these ministries, uh, like water resources, environment, agriculture, and so on, to make better connections, not only to learn, but also contribute to global good practice, and more important, to also help the products become better. So for example, everyone is uh, hungry for data relating to, uh, let's say, uh, calibration or validation of a lot of the models that uh, are uh, being uh, developed. So can we uh, play the role in terms of trying to network a lot of the people developing these kinds of tools with the people who will be using these kinds of tools uh, and get the data flowing back and forth, at least for calibration and validation, if not trying to put the data more in the public domain. And the last uh, I is in terms of the uh, investments. The bank uh, invests, uh, 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 provides investment to the tune of something like about uh, 65 to 100 million dollars, a billion dollars every year in uh, all the countries of the world. So and a, a lot of this is now going towards uh, not just uh, building a road or building a power system, but more to leverage other resources, uh, such as domestic resources, private sector resources, other financing, and so on. So can we use the same concept also for knowledge, where we use the combined uh, knowledge that's here to leverage other people's knowledge uh, so that it can be better uh, pulled together. But also, in terms of the investments, a lot of these don't come free if we need to uh, improve the investments for uh, in situ monitoring or investments for computing or investments for accessing cloud computing or uh, a lot of these uh, uh, kind of improved uh, institutional infrastructure and other things. In uh, addition to uh, using a lot of these data for the actual infrastructure on the ground, such as better managing watersheds, better managing dams, better managing irrigation systems, flood management, and so on. So a lot of these can be used to try and pull together a lot of uh, these kinds of uh, uh, data, uh, information, knowledge, decision support, to provide decision support for planning where you put the next next uh, system, water system, how do you manage it better, how do you operate it better, and so on, and uh, reduce the transaction costs and the time that it takes to get a very clever development like we saw today morning with a lot of the GLOFAST type stuff, which I think is very exciting to get, uh, for example, 10-day forecasts for flows uh, in a probabilistic way, and to use that actually for decision making at uh, different levels. So these are things in which uh, at the bank we'd be happy to uh, work with all of you on these kinds of things so that we can uh, better uh, get our uh, clients better networked with global good practice in this regard. So thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom Graziano. I am the director of the Office of Water Prediction uh, in the National Weather Service, which is part of the National Oceanic and Atm Atmospheric Administration. And I would say the greatest contribution that, that we in, in recent time have made to GeoGlows is providing uh, and Helica Gutierrez's time and services to support the co-leadership of this, uh, this, this group. So, and Helica um, is one of our most talented folks. We're not a big organization. We have about 115 people in the Office of Water Prediction, and Helica is one of our most talented folks, and we spare the, the provide the lion's share of her time so that she can support the important work that, that all of you do. Uh, a little bit about the Office of Water Prediction. Uh, we, we in the Weather Service are operational. We're 24 by 7. We support uh, 13, our infrastructure uh, that provides uh, watch warning and uh, decision support services across the country. Uh, we support 13 river forecast centers and 122 weather forecast offices across the country. Uh, and, and fundamentally, uh, we're, we, in, in the Office of Water Prediction, we have the National Water Center, the new National Water Center, uh, which was referenced a couple of times in a couple of talks when Tuscaloosa was mentioned. It is on the campus of the University of Alabama in, in Tuscaloosa. And it's a, it's a relatively high TRL shop or technical readiness level shop. We are an R2O, or research operations. Uh, that NOAA is just one of, in this country anyway, is one of uh, 24 federal agencies that have some hand in water. Well, the swim lane that we operate in is water prediction. So we're all about transforming our water prediction capabilities. And uh, what we do is we work with other federal partners, the academic community, um, the private sector to evolve or transform our water prediction capabilities. And so um, uh, how do we do that? Well, uh, we, uh, one way that we found very effective to make that happen is uh, we opened the water center, uh, we cut the ribbon on this facility on the 26th of May 2015. 
The very next week, we held the first what we call Summer Institute at the National Water Center. Uh, it's part of what we call our Innovators Program. We work with the National Science Foundation and a group called Quasi, of which Jim is a member and others. Uh, it's the Consortium of Universities for the Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences Incorporated. And what we do is we, we have a competitive process where we bring in graduate students, uh, top-tier graduate students from across the country on a competitive basis to focus on different thematic areas. And the very first year that we did this, what we wanted to demonstrate is that we could, uh, we could predict, uh, generate predictions for uh, uh, at very high space-time resolution, uh, continental scale uh, 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 predictions of, of the entire nation's stream network simultaneously in a high-performance computing environment in real time. And we did that. And so what we did 16 months later, uh, as an example of sort of this innovation, uh, is we implemented what we call our new national water model. So on the 16th of August last year, uh, we implemented what we call the national water model. And why is a national water model important? Well, it's a big step uh, forward in terms of, in a, in a lot of ways. One, from a prediction capability. Two, from uh, providing an architecture that allows, allows now the rapid infusion of research into operations. To give you some sense of the fidelity of the information that we now generate, uh, historically, over the past several decades, we typically just provided um, uh, forecast at about 3,600 of the 8,200 USGS stream gauges across the country. Now, utilizing the national water model, and we did that essentially on a six-hourly or 12-hourly basis. Now, we provide on an hourly basis forecasts for 2.7 million stream reaches across the country, uh, leveraging the U.S. Geological Survey's NHD Plus network, or National Hydrography Dataset Plus, a very, very high fidelity network. And what we did, so sort of the target that we're aiming at in, in the Office of Water Prediction in NOAA is defined based upon, I saw in a couple of slides here this morning, the need to go out and talk to customers and, and stakeholders so you understand clearly what you're trying to achieve. And so what we did over the last five to seven years is we went out and talked to all manner of stakeholder in this country. Uh, didn't matter what you know sector you were in, whether it was emergency management, water management, ecosystem, hydropower, recreation, transportation, you name agriculture. And we fundamentally asked them sort of what keeps you up at night? What are the decisions that you make on a routine basis for which you have insufficient information? And what we did is we, we identified five fundamental thematic areas. One was water availability, one was water quality. These are themes that we've seen on the board here. Uh, one was floods, one was droughts, and then one that sort of cross-cut all of them was climate change. How do we deal with that? And what I found very interesting, uh, having been now in, in the water program in NOAA for over 20 years, is uh, the thing that sort of shocked me or that I was surprised by when we talked to these users is that uh, they asked for information at extremely high fidelity in space and time, much higher fidelity in space and time than, than we provide, we've, we historically have provided and they said, we need, more inf we need information which goes beyond just stream flow or water quantity predictions. We need to understand, we need analyses and predictions of all the parameters or the essential water variables, as you call them, that define the water budget in each one of these catchments if we, if we are to manage our water resources effectively. So that was a little startling for us. And then beyond that, they said, not only that, but we want you to work with us to take that information, that high fidelity information, and link it with geospatial, other geospatial information, whether it be economic, demographic, infrastructural, et cetera, to take that water prediction and convert it into actionable water intelligence. And you talked about decision making, as have other people, and that's really a critical aspect of this. So this is not just a challenge from a physical science perspective, but it's really a challenge for also from a social science perspective. How can we can, can effectively communicate this information in an actionable way? And I think we'd all agree that, that fundamentally uh, we, all, we could come up with the best predictive capability in the world. Uh, we could be clairvoyant with our forecast, but if we don't communicate the, the intrinsic value of a clairvoyant forecast is essentially zero if you don't communicate it well. So we really have to pay attention to the communication piece. And so, um, you know, that's what we're working on. We, we, there, we're working, you know, uh, so it's not just the modeling capability. There's a lot of science work that needs to be done there, whether it be dealing with anthropogenic processes. And we heard some comments about that. Here in this country, anthropogenic processes, we have to account for them because they have such a profound effect on our, our water predictions. And we're, now we're looking at uh, exploring a machine learning approach to, to look at, to, to, to explore that. Um, you know, things that we're working on with the National Water Model, uh, teaming up with the USGS and others on shallow groundwater modeling capabilities, 
hydraulics, uh, water quality issues, um, uh, coastal coupling to get the total water forecast right in the coastal zone, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of work to be done. I like to tell people sort of we're crawling before we walk, before we run. But we've got a clear target in sight, and, and, and the vision for the future is, is really bright. And so we're really excited about what we're doing and, uh, and encourage, you know, collaboration with GEOS. Uh, essentially what we produce is non-proprietary uh, and certainly available for guys like Jim. Your presentation, Jim, was basically, you know, in part anyway, uh, you've been a part of our, our summer institutes the first three years that we've had. By the way, we do them on an annual basis. And that, that work is there to be leveraged and applied elsewhere by change agents like you, Jim, so, and the other folks in this room. So maybe I'll just leave it at that and take any questions. Uh, you no, have. but I, I, not to put you in the spot, sure. uh, on behalf of GeoGloss, definitely we accept uh, the sharing of, of that survey and, and that information. You know, five years of work is, is definitely um, mm -hmm good amount of, of effort there, and, and I'm sure that we could leverage that information to, um, you know, in the community to see what sure. we can do to utilize. You're happy to provide it. It's, it's readily all the, you're talking about all of the uh, stakeholder engagement yes. work? Yes. That's yes, that's readily available. It's all documented. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, true. Thank you. Osvaldo? Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, is my presentation ready? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Angelica. Well, uh, the Brazilian territory is not prone to major disasters like uh, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis. But uh, year by year, the country has been more seriously affected by floods, flash floods, and droughts and landslides. Over 5 million. Uh, Five million of people, uh, mostly poor and vulnerable, uh, live in areas of uh, high disaster risk in Brazil. Uh, other 25 million live in the semi-arid region. And nowadays, we are faced with uh, uh, the risk of lack of water in the metropolitan region of São Paulo city. Uh, Semadem is the National Early Warning uh, Center for Monitoring and Natural Disasters. was created after uh, the emblematic disaster in the Rio de Janeiro state in 2011, where more than 1,000 people died. Uh, and the center implements continuous monitoring uh, of adverse hydrometeorological and climatic conditions which may uh, trigger process that produces uh, imminent risk of natural disasters. Uh, the goal of SEMADEN is to use uh, interdisciplinary perspective to address scientific questions on natural disasters. Uh, SEMADEN has a multidisciplinary team of researchers uh, the goal of the team is through uh, research and, and development uh, deliver products uh, by the operator, operator team, but also increase, to increase the level of knowledge of the science of natural disasters. Uh, our center uh, was opening in 2011. Uh, we work 24 hours, seven days a week and preparation of risk of alerts for landslides, floods, flash floods at a district level. Uh, we have in the operating room a uh, multidisciplinary team uh, like geologists, uh, uh, engineers, hydrologists, uh, meteorologists, and the social science uh, experts. Uh, this is our uh, operational uh, network. It was installed uh, in 2013 and 2014. Uh, hydrological gauges, meteorological gauges, uh, and the uh, radars, meteorological radars. Uh, but uh, uh, 
to do that, we developed two platforms. One platform to integrate the data and the other platforms to analyze the data. Uh, this is the number of our network at the uh, right side and the left side the list of the other uh, sensors that we receive in real time from other partners, state and uh, at level of federal and the state uh, level. Uh, uh, this platform uh, makes the operational transposition of a large amount of data to be used by uh, researchers and the operational team. This is one example that uh, we are doing to uh, deliver uh, early warnings of uh, floods. In Brazil, most floods forecast and the warning system are based either on simplified models uh, of flood wave propagation or on stochastic model. Semaden is developing uh, an operational warning system that proposes to increase the lead time of warning through the use of ensemble forecasting models. Uh, this is another example uh, from uh, hydrological ensemble forecast. Uh, one case study for, uh, for the Acre state in the north part of Brazil, in the Amazon region, considering two the different models, uh, one from the INPE, the National Institute for Space Research, and the, the GLOFAS. Uh, the other uh, example that I can show to you is to, to, uh, to study the water av av availability of San Francisco River. Uh, it's located in, in the north part of Brazil, uh, northeast part of Brazil. Uh, it's based on meteorological and the hydrological models to improve water management and alternatives to attempt sustainable sustainability of water manipulation. Uh, well, no, this one, not, okay, thank you. Uh, large portions of uh, Brazil in the Northeast have experienced uh, intense and the prolonged drought since 2010. Uh, it has sparked a new round of discussion to improve uh, drought policy and the management of water use at federal level. Uh, you have uh, in this part of Brazil a network uh, that has near 600 sensors, different sensors. And uh, Well, in this, the last uh, slide is, is to show to you how you are uh, helping the federal government uh, to control the water uh, used in the Sao Paulo region. You can see that uh, in uh, 1953, uh, in this color, is the level of the reservoir in uh, near, uh, that is used by São Paulo City. And in 2013, 2014, this is the level of the reservoir. So uh, then you are uh, using the same type of model, ensemble model, to do uh, different scenarios for the future. Thank you, Angel. <laughs> I want to welcome Brad Dorn. Hey, I'll make this real short so we, so we can get to, que to questions. Two quick points. One, uh, NASA is and will always be a strong supporter of uh, these types of activities. Uh, we are, uh, we've offered uh, 18 of our projects options to get involved and many of them have offered to get involved in this project. Um, we also have uh, Western Water Application Center, which f targets uh, uh, 
uh, domestic applications in the West. And this doesn't even include our severe program, our capacity building program, our developed programs, our uh, other uh, applied research programs, including disasters, our basic research programs in terrestrial hydrology. Um, throughout that, um, my boss's boss, Mike Freilich, has always said we have a great freshwater story. Uh, we have missions going up now that are really targeting fresh water. And all that, uh, we're spending a lot of money on lots of projects and creating lots of solutions. But you know what? Uh, those solutions don't have a lot of takers. Um, a lot of those solutions don't get taken up and aren't sustainable. And that's where we're really struggling. Um, and that's where uh, we're really looking at GeoGlows at helping us out and providing some sustainable platforms that we can target these solutions and put these solutions into practice. And so with that, I'd like to make my uh, second point. Uh, GeoGlows uh, is a, a wonderful concept and, uh, and solution. I'd like to commend uh, NOAA for their support of it and the International Steering Committee who really stepped up. It's amazing what you guys have done since we started talking about this now a few years ago. Um, but what I've learned now uh, in working with GEO and CIOS and these activities, uh, and this is a little bit call out to the community, is that the only way this will be a success is if we support uh, that secretariat and that uh, and GEOGLOWS. Um, and I, I start sounding like a Washington bureaucrat, but in this case, it really is important because water is such a complicated issue, and we've talked about it this morning about all the interfaces and all the complexities that we have to deal with. Um, that really, uh, if you have the resources, if you have the time, if you have a boss who might be interested, uh, please uh, ask them to get involved with GeoGlows because I think it, it really does need that support at the GeoGlows uh, initiative level so that at some point it will become a flagship. Um, and if you look at our successful flagships like GeoFOI and GeoGlam, you'll see that that's one thing they have. They have strong stakeholder support. They have strong geosecretariat support um, by the stakeholders. And so uh, please get involved, find out ways. It doesn't have to necessarily be money. It can be just time uh, and effort. And uh, certainly from NASA's point of view, uh, when we see GeoGlows, we see an opportunity for getting our observations, our science, our expertise into sustainable solutions. And so we'll be there to support it too. So with that, maybe I'll turn it back to you guys. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, no, no. So I just want to, and, and I just echo Brad's comments, I, I think they're spot on. So, um, But this Angelica, to answer your question before in terms of what the different entities are doing, one thing I, I forgot to mention for CIOS, and, and let my, my good colleague Ishida on in the audience, is in response to the GIOS water strategy, the CIOS response, one thing that was undertaken was a, a water quality imager feasibility study, which was led by Arnold Decker, formerly CSIRO, who retired. Um, Arnold's also worked with the World Bank on some related issues. And so that study is complete. So it, was a, it really is a pathfinder, hopefully, for the future in terms of addressing some of those observation gaps and information gaps in terms of you know what's of interest for geoglows, et cetera. Um, a recommendation also for Angelica and everyone is for the space agencies, so there is a lot of muscle there, there is potentially a lot of money there, be very specific in the requests that you make of them. That's the strategy for the best success. Be very specific in terms of what you're asking of them, and I think that'll help you um, gain more traction with it. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Uh, my name is Omar El-Badawi. I'm from the Center for Environment and Development for the Arab region and Europe. Uh, uh, it's headquartered in Egypt. 
Uh, I'd like to thank all the uh, presenters uh, for the interesting uh, presentations and uh, the work done by uh, all of the organization, NASA, NOAA, and SAS. Uh, 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 but uh, I, I wonder if there is uh, uh, the, all of the work is concentrated on the uh, uh, surface water. Is there any work done for the uh, groundwater, uh, especially the non-renewable aquifers? So on, on our benefit, GeoGloss was launched last year. So we have had uh, less than 12 months of existence. And it is considered part of GeoGloss. So it, it is included in, in our objectives. Um, anyone in the audience? Just to uh, add to that, uh, yeah, uh, definitely you know, surface water, groundwater, the water quality, a uh, lot of water for environment, other things uh, would be uh, part of this uh, GeoGlow's remit. Uh, what we have done is, at least as part of the spatial agent and data and some of the apps relating and uh, e-books, we've tried to integrate groundwater at least as far as Earth observation goes from uh, using uh, GRACE better or uh, using uh, also uh, linking up better with IGRAC the, uh, for uh, uh, trying to get a lot of the existing groundwater data sets uh, to try and uh, liberate them and uh, put them together, as well as some of the work going with, G with GEF on TWAP and so on, to try and get all the hard work that's been done on those to uh, be able to be better discovered, either in the form of data or in terms of some of the knowledge products. But there's still a long way to go for the invisible resource, as the uh, IGRAC people call it. Yeah, um, the example I showed very quickly on uh, Morocco Ten Sift Watershed is dealing with groundwater availability, uh, which is uh, used by a pumping from agricultural manager at plot scale. And um, the combination, it's not only a space of earth observation point of view. It's the combination of earth space, of course, but also in situ and modeling with the dealing with this difficulty to assess the root depth uh, soil moisture information. And the, um, this uh, pilot study uh, stressed stress the, the, the following point that there is a clear need of uh, in situ measurement regarding the root uh, uh, soil uh, depth. And uh, enlarging this discussion to the one uh, Harsh uh, uh, highlighted uh, regarding the Calval aspect or in situ measurement aspects, we have to keep in mind that uh, space measurement will not achieve no, uh, anything without having a sustainable in situ measurement uh, globally distributed in a, a really uh, complementary way. Uh, and I think the GeoGloss program has to take this opportunity to coordinate, coordinate uh, in an international way the needed in situ measurement dealing with the water cycle or hydrology or water resource management aspect. Yes, we have some pilot projects dealing with the groundwater. Uh, we, can, we can discuss uh, later. And as Angelica uh, said, GeoGloss started the 12 years uh, 12 months uh, ago, but uh, as organization uh, gathering here, uh, we, are, we, are, we are working on this uh, aspect since several years. So we have to capitalize with GeoGloss. What are the key uh, now uh, subject for the roadmap for the next uh, couple of years? One last question, please. Yes. Historical data and also the, the future ones too. 
predict uh, landslides. So yes, we support your laws and we would love to work with you. Thank you. Um, I'm Marie Colton. I'm at uh, Harris Corporation now, but I was 33 years in the government. My last assignment was uh, as NOAA's um, Great Lakes Research Director. So I've been thinking a lot lately about public-private partnerships in water. And I uh, have been working, looking a lot at the World Bank um, issues. And so the mission of the World Bank, you know, um, reducing poverty, shared prosperity. So I go back to this fellow who, from Nepal who was talking about the issues about floods and people dying. Ten th thousands and thousands of people displaced, people dying, the Brazil examples. So we have like real world problems right now. And so sometimes I, 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 I think we're asking what kind of some of the specific things could be done. So when we've been looking recently at some of the tenders being offered by uh, the World Bank for like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, developing countries. And um, you, you're trying to modernize the hydromet services. And every one of these countries has the same kind of core set of problems uh, with lack of observational networks, um, not understanding what models are really available, which are the world's best, which ones uh, do people are vetted and they are appropriate to the task, what is the infrastructure. A lot of the countries do not have um, electricity, reliable electricity or fiber. And when we talk about, oh, just send data around, it's not possible. Uh, educational and training is really an important problem. The most of the countries we're talking about do not have uh, trained meteorologists or hydrologists uh, at the PhD level. They have only a few of those, and most of them are sort of in-country trained at a certain level. Um, and then you want to build an economy, so where is the private sector? And that doesn't mean just multinational corporations coming in and taking over, but it means how does a, how does a multinational corporation come in and help a local economy build their own business? So that you have all that issue. I, I see so many um, between WMO, WHO, um, World Bank trying to do these things, but, um, and so many wonderful meetings like this where the talent is here, I think, helping to just articulate what is the minimum basis for an observational network? What are the most vetted, the best vetted models? Who accepts them? Why are they accepted? Um, what is the necessary infrastructure? Um, we toss around the cloud a lot uh, in developed countries as though, hey, cloud's gonna be the answer to big uh, processing. And that, that very well could be the, the answer to a lot of developing countries. But um, there's also sort of this national pride in wanting to be able to build their own system and train their own people. So there's that tension. Um, so, you know, conversation, what is a sort of acceptable uh, within a country? And then recognizing the challenges. You can't just drop people into some of these countries. Their geopolitical challenges are really uh, d difficult. So you just don't send your, weather, your best weather people off wandering around putting in instruments. Um, so, uh, so my point, can these kinds of groups have a sort of an output action from their meetings? Some of these vetted, standardized um, uh, uh, pieces of information so that it can be uh, you don't have to do this every time you go into a country and, and have to put out a three-year study for what is actually needed because it's already done. Sorry, that was a little long, but... <laughs> it's okay. So I'm going to address uh, several points that you made uh, in your remarks. The first one is the um, collaboration between private sector and government. So. Within GeoGlows, we have, unfortunately, she wasn't uh, here, but we have a working group who's looking exactly to developing you know, guidelines for the steering committee on how we are going to engage with the private sector. Because we do recognize that unless we have the private sector engage in GeoGlows, it's going to be very difficult for GeoGlows to move forward its agenda. Uh, the second one, 
the fact that um, you know every country and every region has their own particularities. So that is uh, one of the things that we are doing from the global initiative, which is GeoGlose. And, and I will uh, talk a little bit later on in the day, uh, working with the regional initiatives. And those regional initiatives, you know, those are uh, efforts that have the national, the local flavor uh, that the decision makers in their countries, in geo member countries and, and the region in general, those are the ones leading and guiding the activities. So that is one of the um, advantages that we have within GEO, that we can also not only leverage uh, global initiatives, but also regional initiatives. Okay, I want to thank uh, the panel, and we are going to move on to our next <laughs> group. Thank you all. All right, uh, this seems to be uh, one of the workshops where with, with everything seems to be going uh, as clockwork. Uh, so uh, one of those rare occasions. So uh, please settle down and uh, we'll move straight on to the next segment. Uh, one of the uh, things that uh, I'd like to also mention uh, in regards to your question is that uh, I think th this is the challenge here is that we're all trying to see if we can go from working at the retail level to trying to do things at a more wholesale level and trying to see if we can leverage a lot of these kinds of uh, data platforms and tools and knowledge services that could help in that regard. As part of this moving from retail to wholesale, there's a lot of activities ah, okay. no, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, happening on the spatial front where we are not necessarily going from uh, country level all the way to global, but there are many regional initiatives that are being undertaken. And in this regard, we'll uh, have uh, three quick uh, presentations. Uh, and uh, in this, uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Professor uh, Toshio Koike, uh, who uh, has uh, been uh, one of the stalwarts in terms of uh, trying to promote a lot of Earth observation for water resources, to talk about uh, GeoGlose and the uh, AO Geos and uh, DIAS. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So I would introduce the uh, geogrowth-related activity in Asian and Oceanic region. Uh, the series of the, the discussion in the United Nations framework, uh, the, we uh, try to uh, respond to the, our, uh, the, uh, the international request to us. That is, the, uh, in 2015, we have a three key agenda. The, we are requested to take uh, the concerted action and to, uh, to address the, that uh, uh, request, uh, we need to uh, improve the, the, uh, our uh, capability for this reducing the current risk and uh, preventing the future risk. And, but uh, there is some environmental uh, the, and the disaster damage happen. So we need to improve the, our capability for adaptation and recovery. Then we will be able to develop the re resilient society. This is a very important path to the, towards the, the sustainable development. For that purpose, we need to uh, the, uh, improve our understanding, not only our scientists, but also the society and the people. And uh, we need to strengthen the, our governance and uh, we need to encourage the investment, not only by the government, but also private sector. And uh, we need to improve early warning and uh, build back better. In conjunction with the United Nations high-level uh, group, high-level panel <coughs> on water, the, which uh, consists of the 10 head of states, uh, the, and uh, uh, the, this is initiated by uh, the uh, former uh, Secretary, UN Secretary General, and also the uh, World Bank Group, the president. Uh, we are now making a more concrete plan, especially uh, by the, the uh, one of the special advisors uh, to the, this panel, the Dr. Han Su Su. He is former prime minister of the uh, <laughs> South Korea. He organized the high-level panel on water, high-level expert and leaders panel on water help. 
And uh, we had a joint meeting, and uh, we uh, identify our uh, present status, and uh, we discuss about our key direction, and we uh, define our action to be taken by each country. So each country is requested to develop a platform on war and disaster as a part of the national platform, and the uh, UN uh, partners uh, requested to assist that platform of each country, and the donors they are requested to provide incremental support. This is not only in Asia, but uh, we decided our activity uh, start to uh, start our activity in Asia and expand to the all over the world. According to this Jakarta statement, the uh, we made a more concrete plan. Uh, we need to archive the. Uh, not only the hazard data, but also the damage data and the socioeconomical data set. And then we can improve the uh, integrated risk assessment capability. But you know the risk itself is changing. So due to the, the uh, societal change and also the climate change. So we need to identify the change from past to present and uh, monitor the, the uh, risk of, of the present and the prediction the future risk. And then we can provide usable information for policy making and actionable information for the community of practice. In this way, the data set archiving and the model development and then create a societal benefit. So through the, uh, for this uh, the, uh, <coughs> whole activity, we need to improve our interdisciplinary cooperation and also the transdisciplinary cooperation. And we need to also develop the capacity, uh, not only the scientists, but also the practitioner and the policy makers. So we identify this is the platform on war and the disaster, and uh, the, this should be supported by international cooperation. And uh, as a strategy, uh, we, need, we would uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the benefit to be obtained through the, this uh, platform by using the existing infrastructure at each country and, uh, the, and uh, by uh, uh, engaging the uh, donors funding, we would uh, develop the uh, prototype and uh, by expand, uh, strengthening and uh, expanding the, the uh, prototype uh, and we would develop a, a full operational system. So the, uh, our international uh, the, and the UN agencies have a very good uh, the uh, cooperation of each department agency of each country and uh, the in collaboration with this uh, uh, framework. And in addition, we need uh, cooperation with space agencies. And uh, in some countries, there are uh, there are the space agencies, but uh, in other countries, there are no space agencies. But uh, through the, the cross-cutting cooperation uh, at, in the region, so we will be able to develop the, our uh, cooperative framework. So based on the, this idea, we had a first meeting in January this year, and uh, the, uh, we uh, invited the various countries in Asia as a start, and uh, we identified our activity. Based on the discussion uh, in each country, March or November or May, so we have a lot of the meeting in each country by inviting many stakeholders. Uh, agencies, the department representative, and uh, uh, universities. So this is the, our action, and uh, uh, actual activity has already gone uh, in Sri Lanka and the Philippines. But the uh, time <laughs> coming, so I would uh, stop there my talk here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Koike. Uh, next up uh, will be uh, the person who's a cornerstone of a lot of the GeoGlow's work, uh, who's Angelica. And she'll talk about uh, GeoGlow's in the Americas. So over to you, Angelica. So in, in the Americas, we started in about in 2011, working with the group on Earth observations and uh, doing capacity building uh, and engaging uh, other countries. So what I'm going to show is um, something that we just received uh, last week. And it was in, in some way uh, surprising and not. This comes from Colombia. Colombia is the only country within GEO in which GEO is part of the national, 
public policy. So what it means is that the organizations, the public organizations can apply for budget. Budget can be allocated to activities. Colombia has taken major steps towards uh, making GEO known at all levels. And this comes actually from an NGO, uh, a legal NGO, who are also decision makers uh, within the context of GEO. It's a short video, two minutes. Uh, we don't have. Um, um, how can we? It should work now. Yeah. Just... Okay. legal de la Asociación de Autoridades Tradicionales Indígenas del pueblo de Apoco, Chase. Somos una comunidad de 1.200 indígenas, de las cuales 750 entre mujeres y niños. Queremos hacer un llamado al, al grupo de observaciones de la tierra, especialmente al grupo de agua, para que con su... Con su observaciones, podamos guiar las decisiones en nuestro resguardo relacionado con el manejo de agua. Muchas gracias eh, por su atención y esperamos conocer su respuesta. Eh, Estas eran las aguas del, de, de la laguna Canacanare, donde en un antes había mucha eh, del fin rosado y eh, se redujo todas las aguas y entonces dejaron de existir las, las, las mm, especies naturales como el del fin rosado. Mm, hay mucha contaminación por todo el territorio de los resguardos indígenas, el cual estamos pidiendo por eso que todas las organizaciones internacionales pongan también su grano de arena para que así mismo podamos tener una respuesta positiva. Muchas gracias. What is my point with this video? Um, it's the only one that I have to say we, we have received. Um, we talk about... Okay. <laughs> That's even better. <laughs> um, we have been talking about decision makers from, you know, the uh, governments, etc. Well, we cannot forget that decision makers are at many levels, including uh, decision makers in indigenous communities and vulnerable communities. And so um, in the Americas, we are working with Semedan, you know, at a very high level, with Argentina, with Colombia, the organizations, part of the government. This is actually opening a new door um, this is unfamiliar territory for many of us. So, um, thank you. <laughs> so, I, I just make a call to the audience here um, to join us in this, in this new path. Yes. What she said is, I, I make a call to the group on Earth Observation, the group on Water, so that with your decisions, we can guide the decisions in our community. That's all. So do they want information to guide their decisions? Do they want to understand why the water has to be? That's the question. Right? Um, 
And that's a question probably for the break. Uh, yes. And uh, yes. so what we'll do, thank you very much, Angelica. And uh, just because uh, we have uh, very few minutes left before we have to take a break, so we'll uh, have two more maybe uh, presentations to fit in in that uh, time frame. Uh, thanks, Angelica. And uh, next up will be Rose, who will uh, be making a, a pitch for uh, the, the work that's been happening on geos uh, in Africa region, which, as you know, is one of the regions with uh, some of the biggest needs from the point of view of uh, water resources management and uh, planning. Over to you, Rose. Uh, thank you very much. I must apologize. I arrived late, so if I'm redundant in my contribution, <laughs> it's because I missed what was said earlier on. I'm not going to present on the programs ongoing in Africa, but I'm going to rather focus on the challenges and opportunity areas for earth observation tools uh, that could enhance uh, water governance and water security in the region. As you know, Africa has a lot of water resources, but the issue is the governance and the knowledge on how and what is available to improve the governance and uh, access and management of, of the water resource. Uh, so one of the things that have been identified with our AfriGeos program in Africa is uh, the need to do basin mapping and vulnerability assessments. Of course, these uh, aspects are going on piecemeal, uh, but in order for us to understand what levels of water availability uh, and quantities that are there for the different groups and different levels and different users, uh, we need to do this basin level mapping. <coughs> and as you know, Africa is one of the regions that has a lot of basins, uh, river basins in particular, which are shared across the boundaries. And and what is missing is a common legal framework. And although the, the governments agree on uh, an action plan, uh, it is a, a problem sharing data across the borders because this legal, common legal framework is not something easy to establish, as we all understand. Uh, but it is important that we use the geospatial tools uh, using the earth observation data to establish these baselines uh, and, and, and be able to guide uh, uh, the data policies that could govern water governance uh, in the region. Um, so uh, at the same time, during this mapping, we need to have uh, uh, an understanding of what are the existing international instruments that are actually in, in uh, have been signed up and, and govern the, the basin level actions. Uh, the second thing uh, that has been identified for the region is the need for climate scenarios, in particular for rainfall, because uh, Africa, most communities rely on rainfall for food production for most of their livelihoods. And most of the rural populations are actually relying on water, water from rain uh, for, for domestic and personal uses as, as well as uh, agricultural uses. So really to have these climate scenarios of rainfall and the impact on water resource management and to, uh, and to, to how it impacts on the socioeconomics of, of the communities. Of course, we have lots of tools. I mean, we, we have data science uh, information that exists globally, regionally, and even within uh, particular countries. But what's missing and what could be missing and will be a challenge is the capacity the capacity to, to interpret data, collect the data, analyze it, store it, and share it. And also the behavioral awareness about around uh, these issues. So if we are to strengthen uh, evidence-based decision making, then uh, we have to uh, target all these relevant stakeholders and enhance capacities on how they can sustainably use the tools and the applications and the systems that we generate through the science. How can that be sustainable for, for application? And the second thing is uh, there are different levels of development. Uh, uh, the applicability of these tools or, or, or uh, uh, systems may be different in Europe or in America or in Africa. So what is the level of development? What's the uptake? What's the capacity of the government and the different departments that will need these tools uh, to enhance uh, water security? And then what is the relevance for the sub-national level? Because the focus is normally at national level, discussions at national level, even the SDGs. It's global discussions, national level discussion. What about the, the, the municipalities, the, the, the basins with communities, the catchment areas? How do they utilize these tools? And is it really practical for them? Is it sustainable? Is it affordable? Uh, my other point is the veracity of the data. Uh, we know SDGs are talking about comparability of data, uh, SDG 6 for instance, but then do we have consistent set of rules for data management, for collecting the data within the boundaries of the countries that we can then be able to compare the data on, on a level platform? Uh, is there sufficient training that is envisaged for this? And um, therefore, what I'm arguing for is methodologies and formats for collecting data to make this data credible enough for this comparability. 
Um, so we, as GEO, we advance open data, access to open data, uh, open access to data. But do we, can we really have uh, open access to data or not? Because we have also the rights to privacy. When we talk about leave no one behind, we're going to disaggregate data, collect data about communities, about um, um, uh, Angelica has just shown about this community uh, in Colombia. But there is also very sensitive data uh, with these vulnerable groups. How are we going to, to balance this uh, between open access and sensitivity of data? And therefore, for SDG, uh, uh, the, the development, uh, um, <coughs> development frameworks, uh, for SDG in particular, we've, uh, it has embraced the human rights framework, uh, principles of participation, which uh, uh, Angelica has, has, has uh, uh, also hinted to. Uh, participation of all the people that will be beneficiaries of data or will be impacted by the use of data or the tools. So uh, participation, inclusivity of these uh, stakeholders, accountability, transparency on what we're doing with this data, how is it going to impact on decision making, and then the sustainability aspect of it. So, so there's, there's a balance between the right to access information, but also there's the right to privacy that we need to establish a balance. And this comes from the policy level. What is the government's policy? What is the regional policy? What is the global policy around, around this? And there are lots of discussions around this uh, that are uh, actually going on. So these are the, the, the challenge areas that are identified from the AfriGeos program, from the managers that are managing the programs in Africa. And of course, we know that uh, the capacity element really is never discussed enough and the awareness element. And normally we don't have, we have programs that deal with data science, but we never start with the policy level. What is the enabling environment? Even if we have very fantastic tools or, 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 or uh, applications, is there an enabling environment for this? Is it going to be affordable? So there are all these issues that I think we need to integrate in the initiatives of GeoGloss, and this will need additional support because perhaps the program is really focused on uh, establishing the, the tool or the, the application, but who takes care of this policy level and who takes this package that is finished to its usability and create that link so that uh, decisions are made when they're informed. Thank you very much. I'll Thank you, you, Rose. So I think, uh, you know, we've uh, seen many different perspectives uh, from many different uh, uh, players here on uh, how to look at these, not just at the national level, but also at some of these regional uh, focus areas, whether it be Asia, the Americas, or in Africa. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, something that we can discuss more with the speakers as we uh, break out uh, shortly. Uh, I have a, a particular conflict of interest because although I'd like the discussion to go on for a long time, I'm the last speaker in the next session. Uh, so uh, I need yeah. to make sure that all of you go get your coffees and come back. But is there any burning uh, thought that's there that can be expressed in a minute or so? Please, ma'am. Um, please keep it short. Uh, my name is Pilar Cornejo from Ecuador. And I just want to make a comment for what happened in Africa regarding Latin American experience. And is that uh, when you don't have a legal framework that is common for the countries, maybe you can use the, the global ones. For example, if your country signed the Sendai framework of action, then your country is committed to certain specific things. If your country it's has uh, with the agreements of the International Hydrology Program of UNESCO, then you have transboundary uh, basins groups, you have the hydrology for environment life and policy groups that you can't uh, use as umbrellas for the people in the different countries to work together. So then you sort of uh, build bottom up uh, things with the people in the programs and then you can convince the countries with results. Thank you, Maria. And uh, I've just been uh, told that our last speaker has uh, been here all this while and we didn't know. Uh, so, uh, Sarva, over to you for a very short uh, presentation. Yeah, all right. yeah all right. I know I'm the last person between you and your break, so I'll be real quick. So, my name is Sarva Pula. I'm a geospatial software engineer at the Severe Science Coordination Office at NASA Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. So today I'll just be talking about the Severe applications to address water challenges in Africa and uh, what we have done so far. So Surveyor has been around for over 10 years. It's a joint partnership between NASA and USAID. And we have regional networks, or hubs as we call it, in uh, four different parts of the world, like in Eastern Southern Africa, West Africa, and uh, Mekong region, and in hindu Kush Himalaya region as well. And we have one coming up in Mesoamerica. And the main goal of Surveyor is to help developing countries to 
use information from Earth observing satellites and to also help them develop applications so that they can use them at their own local level. And uh, today I'll be talking more about what we've done in Africa and how we have leveraged the free and open source software suites that are available to bridge the gap between decision makers and scientists. And so for the data sets, we've used a lot of NASA data sets that are open and available to the public, and also some of the other data sets that are available through NOAA as well. So how do we do that? We did that by using the Tethys platform. So you might have already gotten a brief introduction through Jim's presentation through the Stream for Prediction tool. So that was developed in the Tethys platform. So what Tethys platform is, it's a development environment for developing any water resources web apps. So that's how it was designed and developed initially, to lower the barrier for development of web apps for water resources. And, uh, and what we've seen is that it has significantly lowered the barrier for development, so, so much so that even people like, for example, at the National Water Institute, Quasi has summer institute and they have students coming in and develop some apps or develop some workflows on how they can use the National Water Model. And just for the past two years, students have actually developed some apps that actually leverage the National Water Model, even when they had like hardly any web development experience. And another neat thing is that Tethys also comes with a portal where you can easily deploy the apps that you have developed. And so we have several apps that we have already deployed in our Tethys portal on our Surveyor Global website. And that's what makes it sustainable and easy is that if you have multiple portals and mul multiple websites, you can deploy whatever apps you've d developed onto those portals. So here I'll just talk very briefly about three apps that we've developed, especially with Africa in mind, is like the Grace Viewer. So the Grace Viewer, it's uh, taking the, the Grace data that is being put out by the Grace satellites, and uh, we are able to visualize it and also subset it for a more recent scale. So here, it's an example of how we We've used a script that was developed at JPL by Dr. Cedric David, and we were able to subset it for Niger. So we can subset it for any region. And we also developed a few other apps kind of to leverage more tools that are being produced. So the Rias Viewer, it's a framework that was developed at JPL that couples a hydrologic model with a crop model called DSAT, and it kind of allows you to run nowcast and forecast. So it's a database, and now we created a front end where you can see it. So again, bridging the gap between decision makers and scientists. So that's the Rias viewer for the DSAT interface where you can view different crop yield. And it's using the VIC model or for forcing. And finally, another app that we developed is the Furla Ephemeral Water Body Monitoring Dashboard. So in, in West Africa, like pastoralists really rely heavily on uh, these furlough water bodies. And so we've used Google Earth Engine on the back end to map out these water bodies out in the desert. And we were able to just create a nice, simple interface. So just a quick roundup, if there's anything that you get out of this presentation is that we're able to like really quickly develop these applications. And the turnaround time is like really short. Like for example, the last app that I showed, it took like two days to develop it. And all our code is available on GitHub at github.com slash severe. We're always open to collaboration and we're always open to feedback. And we just continue to build on the apps that we already have and continue supporting what we're doing. And eventually, we'd like to continue helping GeoGlose and also use GlowFast and uh, implement that, those workflows into a Tethys app. So that's what we plan on doing in the future. And you can find more information at our website. Right. Thank you, Sarva. Um, I think. Uh, I think uh, I have a lot of questions that we'd like to follow up with you in the future, but now we need to uh, yeah. run to the coffee break. Uh, and uh, for about uh, 10 minutes, please grab your coffee, uh, wolf it down, or bring it in, and hopefully you can bring it in. And uh, we'll start the next session. Thank you again all for coming, and thanks to, to the great panel that we've had. Hello. Hi, as you guys are coming in, I'd like to make a quick announcement. Um, and, and it surrounds, surrounds why I'm wearing black. And it's not a Johnny Cash uh, convention. But at 1 o'clock, we're uh, doing a little bit of an awards announcement of our GEO Award. We had a solicitation on GEO. 
uh, activities, and there's four projects on GeoGlows that we're awarding. So about eight hundred thousand dollars or so that'll be going to projects that'll support GeoGlows. That's at one o'clock. I know you guys are having a hard time getting lunch in there, but if you care to join us, we're we're kind of doing a Oscar or Emmy style announcement. So um, so I didn't have a tux, so I I did the best I could. So thank you. <laughs> and apparently, you will have to find where it is. <laughs> okay, in the interest of keeping us more or less on time, uh, I'd like to get us started. And you're not here to listen to me, so I'll give my introduction as the last few people filter in. I'm Derek Vollmer. I'm the Senior Director for Freshwater Science at Conservation International. In the context of our discussions today, I would put Conservation International in the realm of boundary organizations. We have people in our science division, like me, who work with those of you who produce the data and information products. But really, our goal is to work with our field divisions to turn this information into knowledge and influence decisions and conservation outcomes on the ground. And so we're going to shift the discussion now a little bit from water as being sort of the, the object to water being the medium. And we're going to introduce some of the other water-related activities under GEO and um, also talk about ecosystems and biodiversity. So going beyond just water as the commodity, but what are the other important links to water? And also, what can these groups do in terms of being users of products from GEO Glows? So our first speaker is Adrian Strauch. I will uh, allow him to introduce himself a little bit further. We'll keep everyone on a tight timeline. And so I'm going to be sitting right next to the speakers. And we'll prod you and start to be really rude when you get over your seven minutes. So Adrian, floor is yours. Thanks. Do I need this one, or is this one? Yeah, that one should work. Okay, Fine, actually, yeah, I'll turn it off. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, actually, this morning I already chaired a session, but I rem remembered that I forgot to introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Adrian Strauch from the University of Bonn in Germany, and I'm also a co-lead of the New Geo Wetlands Initiative, which is actually has been founded at the same time as Geo Glows. And it's kind of on the intersection between water and uh, ecosystems or biodiversity. So the focus is on wetland ecosystems, but of course it involves a lot of water information and water activities. And that's also the reason why we are part of this side event here. And so, yeah, here you can see the logos of the, the core partners of Geo Wetlands at the moment, but we are also one goal and also for, for this event here is really to expand this a bit more, but I will talk a bit more about this. So as an overview, the, the mission and the objectives of Geo Wetlands are basically to develop sustained global approaches to wetland inventory, mapping, monitoring, and assessment. And um, yeah, the objectives in a bit more detail are to develop a wetland observation system, a global wetland observation system, but which should also be able to go down to different um, scales, like the national level and also the local level on individual wetland sites. And this is, of course, a bit more on data and products, but then we also have the, the goal to establish a community, an active community. So the whole initiative is very community driven, actually. And also we need a governance structure to support the, the long term um, the long term maintenance of geo wetlands and everything we are doing. So this is a bit more on the users and also on management of the whole initiative to have an efficient management. And then the, the third objective is, is to, to build on existing efforts and not to start from scratch, but to really look at what's already there, who are the important stakeholders that we need to engage in GeoWetlands, and also what are existing projects or initiatives that should become either part of GeoWetlands or that we should closely cooperate with. So this is the focus on cooperation and stakeholders, so more, also more on, the, on policy aspects. And, um, and some of the more specific goals to, to to fulfill these objectives are first to, to build a geo wetlands community portal, but then also to respond to evolving user needs and, and policy needs. So really work with the, the actual end users of what we are doing f right from the start and then to um, develop a strategy or strategies and try to find funding for, for long term uh, service provision. So to the geographical scale, so at the moment, 
Geo Wetlands is a bit focused on, on Europe and Africa. That is actually the reason for this is that some of the main projects supporting the establishment of Geo Wetlands are European funding. So from ESA, for example, but also from the European Commission, there are big projects that allowed us to, to yeah, to to launch Geo Wetlands. But our goal is really to expand this and to. Um, yeah, involve others. I mean, like we already started some discussions and I hope we can continue this year with uh, NASA, USGS and others. And I mean, the, the close connection to GeoGlows will hopefully also help to, to broaden this scale and to finally reach our final goal of global coverage and also of a global community working on wetlands. Um, yeah, and just as a summary, some of the main achievements. I mean, one achievement is already that we were able to, to launch Geo Wetlands or to form Geo Wetlands in 2016. But some, some more specific uh, achievements are on the one hand, we, we already have a, a pilot of a portal, a community, a Geo Wetlands community portal, which has been developed by the SWAS project, but which hopefully will continue being developed even after the end of the project and become a core component of Geo Wetlands. Then um, there have, are several. Uh, mapping tools, toolboxes that are developed currently by different projects which are part of Geo Wetlands and will hopefully then also be maintained after these projects and be um, yeah, evolved by uh, contributions from new projects and other partners in the future. And then also one achievement I think is that we already have a quite big uh, user community through these different projects that contribute to Geo Wetlands but also through the involvement of, of core stakeholders like the Ramsar Convention and we are now in discussions with UN Environment regarding the SDG 6 and so there is quite a big uh, community interested in Geo Wetlands and I think now we have to make good use of this and try to, to develop strategies that can maintain this effort in the future. <laughs> So um, some of the planned deliverables are an operational community portal based on the pilot we have right now. So to really evolve this and keep it, maintain it. And um, we are working on global products on mangroves, for example, which is already a bit further advanced than for some other wetland types. But the goal is really to, to provide global products in the future. And um, yeah, we are working on best practice guidelines on the Earth observation of wetlands together with Ramsar and also in the context of the SDG 66 now. And um, yeah, more general plans are to establish a, a website um, as a community and information hub. So the Geo Wetlands website, which at the moment is in a rather um, preliminary stage, will be improved in the near future. So we are working on a concept to really develop this into a into a hub for the wetlands community and with a focus on earth observation of wetlands. And yeah, we continue collaboration with the important uh, global stakeholders. And to yeah, finish this, so our connections to other geo initiatives, of course, as I said, we are in the interface between ecosystems, biodiversity and water. So our closest partners in geo are probably GeoBon with its freshwater bond and marine bond, but also GeoGlows, of course. That's why we are here today. and. Beyond this, I think there are also a lot of other, at least theoretical links to other geo initiatives which haven't really been looked into in detail for now. But I mean, wetlands are very important for with regards to energy production, hydropower, then also for food production, etc. So there are lots of, of links that we should at least look into and have on the, our minds. And yeah, with regard to the SDG, of course, SDG 6 is our focus and the indicator 661, which is called Change in Extent of Water-Related Ecosystems over time, is of course one of our core goals to really provide methodologies, tools, and capacity building, and also coordination for really allowing the use of Earth observation products and data for, for supporting the <coughs> monitoring of this um, indicator. And some of the challenges I see, I mean, what we already mentioned today, so I think it's very important that we develop efficient communication and cooperation between the different geo initiatives. That's also one of the core objectives of this meeting here today. So I think it's very important that we continue this and really look into how the geo initiatives can work together to support the SDG process and also other ongoing global international processes. And one of our main challenges at the moment is to look into the securing long-term funding for geo wetlands because, as I said, it's mainly project-driven at the moment, but several of these projects are going to end next year, so we really have to look into strategies for maintaining what we developed already and move from a development stage into a more operational um, implementation phase with a long-term perspective. So that's it. 
Thank you. And if you have more questions, just ask me. Maybe. And we also have a poster here at the European Commission panel, so there you can get more information if you want. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. Um, if you have questions for the individual speakers, I'd encourage you to find them during lunch or as we transition to the World Cafe. We will have some time at the end of this session for a more general discussion, uh, but we don't want to eat into that time with questions for the individuals just yet. So next I'd like to invite Alan Bellward to come up and talk about the Global Surface Water Explorer. Okay. Looks like you are Thank you. That's me. <laughs> All right. Great. <laughs> yeah. So this is a project we've been running for about four years. Um, three of us from the Joint Research Center and Noel Gorelick from Google. Um, the name says it all, really. It's about to explore surface water on the global scale. Um, the mission objectives and goal is rather simple. It's to document every pixel globally and look at the transition from land to water month by month, year by year, using the whole of the Landsat archive going back to 1984. So we, we don't use Landsat 4 at the moment, but we do use all of Landsat 5, all of Landsat 7, and all of Landsat 8. Uh, second thing that goes with the project is that that has to be validated. So there was an exhaustive 40,000 point control system validation for it in time and cross sensor. And then the third thing is that it has to be free and open, and so we have a web service that goes with it. So I've already said the scale, it is global. Um, we did it using an expert system running on the Google Earth Engine platform. Um, so it is a collaboration between the two of us, uh, between JRC and, and, and Noel's team. And the achievements, well, this is the only map that you can see. So I followed the template. And that's the only shot you're going to get of the Global Surface Water Explorer. But that should give you a feel for it, because basically every one of these maps has time sort of built into it, if you like. The intensity of the blue is dependent on the amount of time that particular pixel has been water over the 32 years. So if it's totally blue, it's always, always water, and there's never been anything else. If it's white, it's never been water. And if it's one of the pink tones, it's been water some of the time. Now, we break it down a lot more specifically than that, because we determine water that is permanent throughout a year or only there for a few months of the year. And then we look at changes in that over time as well. So we can look at permanence uh, in, in both annual inter- and intra-annual situations. That then allows us to look at things like recurrence, so we can look at when there's water, how often is there water there. So is it there for April, May, and June of every year, or is it more ephemeral, as we saw earlier? So you get the ephemeral data, you get the recurrence, uh, the, the, the Servier example that we saw just before coffee. It's the same sort of concept there, that you get the recurrence rate. It's, it's April, May, June every single year. That's a reliable water source. Um, so we get that, and then the final three products are maximum surface water extent, uh, which tells you any pixel that's been underwater at any time for 32 years. Transitions, which is where permanent water has disappeared or appeared, like building a dam. Build a dam, you go from a river to a lake, take the dam away, you go backwards uh, or, or drying out. So we, we have all of that uh, together. All of that is available right down to a pixel level history across the 32 years. So you can go into the website, go to any location, and you get month by month, year by year, when there's data, when there's observations, and it will tell you whether it was water or land at that location. Looking to the future, we just finished packaging uh, the 32-year annual permanent water record by country for UN Environment for a consideration as 6.6.1 reporting. It's part of that. We're interested in coastal movement because we do coastal and inland waters. Um, and we're looking at also differentiating between natural and artificial. We also want to bring it up to date because the current one finishes in 2015. Uh, and we want to add Sentinel-2 into the, into the mix as well. And then the last slide, or last but one slide, is where we see links to other things. This actually didn't start driven by 6.6.1. It was driven by the climate change essential climate variables. And we wanted to answer the question, where is the world's truly permanent water? You know, it doesn't move from year to year. It's always there for the models. 
And so that was the first starting point. Can we identify the always, always water? And the answer is yes, we can, and it's 87% of the permanent water in the world. We've got 184,000 square kilometers of new lakes appeared in the last 30 years, and we've got about 90,000 square kilometers of lakes that have completely disappeared over the last 30 years, and the rest hasn't changed. And we've now got all that, all that documented. We are linking it to 6.6.1, and we're also working with the CBD linked into Adrian's talk that, that we just heard, and uh, the Convention on, to Combat Desertification, where surface water is part of the composite land degradation story that we're telling. And if you want to get in touch with us, there's a sort of generic email that'll contact all four of the people involved in this project. And if you want to go through the website with me, I'm here and more than happy to show you how it works and what's where. You can get all the data as well, by the way. Uh, so you can go in and you can download the individual maps and, and have access to, 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 to the whole set. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very efficient five minutes. Uh, but we'll, we'll continue moving. So next up, I'd like to invite uh, Aaron Hester, who I think is still here. Yep. Um, Aaron's going to talk about the freshwater group from Geo Bon. And let's see, do you have slides? Thank you. So um, I'm here uh, presenting on behalf of the chairs of the Freshwater Bond, none of whom unfortunately could make it today. So uh, I'm happy to uh, inform you that the Freshwater Bond was recently recognized as a thematic bond uh, just this past June. It is a voluntary community of practice that promotes the establishment of best practices for tracking glo global biodiversity change in inland waters. Freshwater ecosystems uh, underpin uh, much of the biodiversity in the world, and they are some of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. Much as many of you have highlighted water as being a cross-linking uh, item across many different SDGs and across many benefit areas, I would argue that healthy water ecosystems are a really important component of our water planning and management globally. Um, so what we're hoping to get to by 2020 is to create a global network of experts and practitioners that can make these global assessments for the status and trends of freshwater biodiversity so that we can hit those 2020 targets for the Convention on Biodiversity. And I think that there is real urgency in the freshwater space because of the rapid losses in uh, biodiversity that we're currently seeing. So this is a global network of individuals. Currently, I've shown you a map of where our membership lies. We have uh, about 135 members right now at this point, and we're continuing to grow that. And we're really, again, working on promoting best practices to improve the harmonization of data collection globally, to develop data standards and methods for data management and dissemination, facilitate data sharing, integrate the biodiversity information with other physical and chemical data that describe the habitats that these organisms live in, and produce products that, again, are really useful for water managers and decision makers. So our planned activities, we don't have uh, that many outcomes yet since we're relatively new. Um, but again, what we're really focusing on again is harmonizing those tools to make sure that we have uh, globally consistent assessments that are done with standard protocols. And we're really interested in helping mobilize the freshwater biodiversity data and get it into the hands of geoglows so that you can use that information in water planning. We're also supporting IC, uh, IUCN's Red List of Ecosystems team. Uh, in particular, we're working on uh, supporting the global classification of freshwater ecosystems. And we're interested in supporting uh, monitoring programs and helping members publish their work and get funding for projects that do support those biodiversity assessments. Um, we support other geo groups, uh, and we hope to be uh, more supportive supportive of GeoGlows and get you the information you need to ensure that you're balancing ecosystem needs with other water delivery. And uh, additionally, additionally, working with Geo Wetlands, uh, AquaWatch, and some of the other bonds to make this happen. 
So um, in this uh, immediate future, we will have macroinvertebrate and fish sampling protocols that should be harmonized and standardized within the year. We're also promoting the use of indigenous and local knowledge. This is going to be key, particularly for these uh, local ecosystems. And again, really with a focus on data mobilization. Uh, in the near future, we will also have sampling protocols for eDNA, algae, zooplankton, phytoplankton, and fungi. And we're going to have harmonized observations of reptiles, mammals, birds, and amphibians, as well as protocols for ecoacoustic monitoring. Um, in general, what we're really looking to do is, again, grow this network, activate this network, um, get these sampling protocols in place while uh, facilitating and promoting the use of indigenous and local knowledge, which is key to understanding biodiversity, and uh, focusing, again, on data mobilization and this global classification of freshwater ecosystems. So there's a strong link with the Sustainable Water Futures Program, which you're going to hear about uh, a couple speakers from now, so I won't talk too much about that here. But this is going to be really helpful for achieving uh, the Ramsar Convention goals, among others. Uh, we're directly contributing to the SDGs uh, 15.1 uh, and 15.5. Uh, but again, I think that healthy water ecosystems really cross-cut all of our other water challenges, and we need to think about them integrally, which is part of the definition of sustainability, my definition. Um, so I changed this from challenges and issues to challenges, but also opportunities. Um, we need to define our essential biodiversity variables. This is a challenge that all of the bonds are addressing right now. But I think it's very important for us to coordinate with you in the uh, essential water variable and essential climate variable uh, definition. because. You need biodiversity in your water planning, and we need to understand these essential water variables in order to understand the drivers of freshwater biodiversity and how they're changing. So I think that we need to work closely as we're defining these variables, um, and we look forward to working with you on that. So I'm also encouraging you to join the bond. It is a voluntary group of practice. There is a general email list here that goes to all of the chairs. Uh, and we also have a ResearchGate uh, project page if you want to go there to dig into the publications, get data, and coordinate with the network as well. So thank you. Thank you, Erin. She's already teed up some good uh, ideas on synergies among the different geo groups, and that's something we hope to discuss uh, after we've gotten through our speakers here. Next up, I would like to invite uh, Michelle Thiem from the World Wildlife Fund to talk about her Free Flowing Rivers program. You've got slides, right? Yes. Okay. Good morning. I'm Michelle Team. I'm with uh, WWF based here in DC and I am similar to Derek. I'm kind of at that boundary between science and application. Um, I lead our science work out of the US water program. So today I'm going to talk to you about a project that we've been leading on identifying free flowing rivers around the world. Uh, for those of you who are not in the biodiversity space, why do we care about free flowing rivers? Uh, one is that they provide a lot of important sediments to downstream uh, coastal deltas as we see deltas sinking with rising sea levels and uh, due to um, the amount of sediments trapped upstream behind dams. They also provide uh, sediments to floodplains for agricultural activities. And they're uh, really important for, they're kind of the, the freshwater equivalent of terrestrial wilderness areas for rivers. Um, and so for freshwater biodiversity, these uh, habitats are quite important. We also know that uh, rivers around the world are changing in terms of their connectivity. We're in the midst of a global hydropower boom. This is being driven by important reasons in terms of climate change and greenhouse gas emissions trying to reduce those, but it's also causing problems for our river ecosystems and the freshwater biodiversity that live within them. So the current situation is that there is no real uh, 
universal definition of what a free-flowing river is. There's no global registry of where these systems occur. And that creates a situation where uh, we are uh, limiting the awareness and the motivation to keep these systems in place or to restore them where they're critically needed. And so what we undertook, decided to undertake was a global assessment of free-flowing rivers. And it's not only the assessment that it's important, it's also the methodology that has uh, developed as part of this that can be applied at multiple scales. Because as many of you know, global data <laughs> sets are limited. So with global data, we're only able to do this type of assessment to a certain extent. And then with that in mind, uh, Global inventory will identify those long free-flowing rivers that remain. The research team was multi-organizational, um, included uh, representatives of CI and Nature Conservancy, as well as a host of universities. The main uh, university involved was McGill University, who had a postdoc on this full-time for several years. I don't have a lot of time to go into this in detail, but just quickly to walk you through the methods. Once we came up with an agreed upon definition, we then looked at identifying global data sets for pressure variables that affect the free flowing nature of rivers. So things like infrastructure and floodplains, dams, and so on. And then we uh, came up with several weighting methodology or several ways of weighting those different uh, pressure variables. Uh, seven different scenarios and benchmarked those against known free-flowing rivers, chose the best weighting scenario, and applied that to every river reach globally, 12 million river reaches in the Hydrosheds database. And then from that, uh, we said whether or not each of those river reaches was above the threshold for free-flowing and then looked at those, only those stretches that went from source to outlet. And outlet is defined here either as the next largest, biggest river or the ocean. And those that were, were considered free flowing. The others might have been a stretch that was above the uh, threshold or not free flowing at all. And this is a graphic that describes that in more detail, showing you what, how we define a river. Um, the BBs are backbone. <laughs> Rivers are each numbered in the scenario A. Then the application of this connectivity status index to each of those stretches of river. And then those rivers, based on that connectivity status index that from source to outlet reach the threshold were then identified as free flowing. So for example, BB4 in scenario C here. This is the picture of the results globally for each of those river reaches showing their connectivity status index. And you can see uh, how it varies across the world with um, a lot of impacts in the north and less so in the tropics and in the Arctic. And here are the results for global uh, river status in terms of free flowing or not. The dark blue are the remaining free flowing rivers globally. So a couple of messages about the results. One is that we're losing the world's largest free flowing rivers. This is not surprising. Uh, previous studies have indicated we we're going in this direction. And only a handful of those that remain free flowing still reach the sea. The tropics and the Arctic are really the final frontiers for where these remain. And that in other places in the world, dam removal presents an opportunity for us to reconnect rivers, especially where there are dams that are no longer serving their original function. And we see these results being applicable for multiple uses. One is, first off, just raising awareness of the loss of this critical natural infrastructure for freshwater systems. The second is around incorporating some of the connectivity metrics, the river connectivity metrics that we've developed into planning at the system scale for hydropower and other infrastructure. And the third is taking this global methodology and downscaling it in particular river basins for use in um, informing both protection, restoration, and some of this basin scale planning efforts. And with that, I will end. And thank you. My email's here if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Michelle.
Next up, we're going to have uh, is Paul DiGiacomo here. He's still here. Yeah. All right. Uh, talking about the Future Earth Lagoon Workshop. Do you have slides this time? No. You don't. All right. No slides. Seven minutes, no slides. <laughs> can we put this down there? Yeah, I can put that down. I'll screw up anything. Okay. Um, so good morning all. So I'm here speaking on behalf of Future Earth and Future Earth Coasts. Um, Future Earth is, um, focuses research for global sustainability. Future Earth Coasts, for those of you who have been tracking, there's a lot of acronyms and organizations to follow, but Future Earth Coasts is what used to be land o LOICS, the Land Ocean Interactions in the Coastal Zone program, so UNEP uh, IGBP activity. It's now called Future Earth Coasts. And one thing that they did in conjunction with uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, is to realize that there's a lot of activities underway these days, but one uh, area and region really still not getting a lot of attention is that of, uh, of coastal lagoons. And in that sense, our, our tagline going forward is lagoons for life. And um, I think most of us are aware, but lagoons are hot spots of human settlements and activities influenced by both land input, nutrients, runoff, river management activities, and likewise interaction with the sea, tides and pollution, erosion, storm surges, and sea level change. And as a result, these are very dynamic regions, and also they're very sensitive to environmental and climate change. Um, but that said, our knowledge of how these regions work is, is generally speaking, very limited. So in this context, and I'll give you the bottom line up front, but then go back to some of the details, but I think that there's an opportunity and a need, and again, where it fits in terms of priorities, is to establish a global lagoon monitoring service. And I see this as an activity being done in concert with a lot of the geo organizations we've heard of this earlier this morning, some we'll hear of later tomorrow. Um, but in terms of geoglows on the land side, of course, uh, geo wetlands that Adrian spoke of, uh, AquaWatch that I mentioned this morning and I'll be speaking of tomorrow for water quality, and then also the Geo Blue Planet Initiative, which I'm not sure has really come up today, but I'll be speaking on that tomorrow as well. And Geo Blue Planet is under the, um, coordinating the coast and ocean activities for Geo, so it's a, a Geo initiative. So in that context, I, I think that there's an opportunity to really cross cutting these different geo activities and geo initiatives um, to focus on um, coastal lagoon regions. So toward this end, um, the European Space Agency in concert with um, uh, Future Earth Coast held a workshop last September, understanding the effect of environmental climate change on coastal lagoon management, potential and challenges for Earth observation, again with a very strong focus on Earth observations. I was there, Rick was there, I don't think anyone else was here, and a lot of other folks that are well known to our respective geo communities. It was hosted at the University College Cork, which is where the Future Earth Coast Secretariat is based. Um, in terms of the focus on the workshop, so again, really in terms of how do we move forward, what are some of the challenges, but more so opportunities in terms of earth observations for lagoons. So some of the themes were lagoon monitoring and management issues. Second one was the potential of earth observations for coastal lagoon monitoring and management. And then the third one was the challenges posed and potential identified solutions towards future research. But again, research ultimately with an aim towards this transition to operations and to provide monitoring and forecasting services for the lagoons. In terms of some of the outcomes and deliverables, and again, this was less than a month ago, so we're still digesting what we did and um, working on the way forward. But one is to establish an international transdisciplinary network of scientists and researchers for this study of effects of the environmental and climate change impacts of, of global lagoon systems. And that was a very good start in terms of the workshop. And I thank Rick for the opportunity to speak here for those of you who are interested in lagoons. Second one, we're talking about putting together a, an inventory and a comprehensive assessment in terms of what is actually known about coastal lagoons for a peer-reviewed publication. Um, third is for the identification of collaborators in common thematic areas where we're able to respond as everyone else for uh, potential opportunities for funding in the future. And a fourth is a more tractable one, but working with um, some of the activities out there, for example, there's a global lakes program some of you might be familiar with. But there's extensive data sets that already exist out there for both satellite data as well as in situ. And 
that were developed for other applications, but how do we harvest those and go in and figure out what we can do in terms of uh, additional uh, leveraging for coastal lagoons? And it turns out there's a lot of observations out there that we're going to be able to leverage. Part of these are there's a Limnati's um, database. I know Aaron, others are uh, aware of that. Talking about what parameters are out there, doing a survey in terms of GEM database, some of these other databases, and then likewise coordinate with other organizations for socioeconomic parameters and coordination. So I'll stop there, but again, to mention that coastal lagoons, lagoons for life, and again, not just what lives in the lagoons in terms of very important in terms of nurseries and aquaculture, fisheries, et cetera, but also the protection, physical protection that they provide for humans, for sea level rise and inundation events. So very critical areas, understudied, underobserved, and so we're hoping to work together with these different geo initiatives and to be able to move forward and how do we apply existing and future earth observations for lagoons for life. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, you could ask a quick clarifying question while I'm uh, booting this back up. Paul did have about a minute left in his allotment, so we'll allow it. Sorry. Um, okay, yeah, Marie Colton at, at Harris again. Uh, so, um, our company is actually located in Melbourne, Florida, on the Indian River Lagoon, which has been having all kinds of horrible uh, outbreaks in the last five or six years. And you know, so we, our company, started getting really interested in what does it mean to be a good steward in your own environment. Uh, we looked a lot at what data are available for studying lagoons and what the issues were. And even the fact that within one lagoon you have basically five independent <coughs> ecosystems because it goes from salt to brackish right. to fresh. And um, so the thinking was that technology, uh, like a space-based te technology, may be really problematic for looking at most dynamics. So where do you stand on the use of like drones, hyperspectral sensors, autonomous sensors, uh, really coming into the hyperbole? Short answer is yes. Um, but the, the longer answer is, you know, it's, it's very complicated in terms of all those are more evert, emerging observing system capabilities. And so part of the question is how do you translate the observations? How do you translate the observations into information, actionable information by the users, the decision makers? How do you address important issues like calibration and validation? Not so easy with those kind of observing system technologies. Um, but but the, sh you know, the, the bottom line answer is we need to leverage all the existing from both a global synoptic sense, um, particularly with ESA looking at things like Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, those very higher resolution optical imagers, but like you said, going down to some of these, the drones, um, using gliders and situ capabilities, et cetera. So it's gonna require all those. But those are, are really an uh, area of emerging capabilities, I think collectively as an EO community, we need to figure out how to better leverage um, and again, focus on how do you extract information that's actionable from those. So it's a good question, Marie. Thank you. So next up, I'd like to invite uh, Ian Harrison. Ian is someone who wears many hats uh, and works around the clock. This morning, he's <laughs> gonna be talking about his work with the Sustainable Water Future Program. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I, I am uh, really speaking on behalf of the, the entire group of, uh, from the, uh, the Freshwater Biodiversity Working Group. That's about 18 people or so. Um, and the group uh, is, was formed about, about a year ago, so we're still in early stages. There are a couple of, um, of main, um, main projects that we are that, that we are attempting to advance. So one is uh, the, uh, a program for integrating in situ observations with remotely sensed earth observation data. So, so the idea is linking satellite imagery, environmental data um, that has uh, societal relevance as well as, uh, as, as, well as biodiversity re relevance. Um, so we can map uh, traje trajectories of change for species um, and, uh, and ecological assemblages. And um, so it's, this, is, this is kind of part conceptual at the moment. Uh, the, the, there is a sort of a, a backbone of information which is, which is already in, um, the, uh, supplied in the Hydro Atlas um, program based out of McGill. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be drawing on that quite extensively. 
um, particularly the GIS variables that are in there. Uh, that are that are there are there are a great number of variables in there already. Many more that are that are being added in in the next six months or so. Um, uh, a uh, an updated version of that should be made public. Um, but then including other biodiversity data, there's a large amount of species information data from the freshwater information platform, which was developed through the Biofresh um, project, the EU-funded Biofresh Bio project. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of species information data from the IUCN Red List. And of course, the, the, the kinds of information that would be coming in from the, the, the freshwater bond activities um, will, will also be very important for, for this. Um, and then bringing in uh, other other remotely sensed variables, which um, uh, w which are available that can be can be integrated with these sort of core biodiversity data sets. Um, then the second program that that we are developing is um, an assessment of flow alteration uh, and how this affects threatened species. So um, we're looking at the uh, the, the the global. Um, the the, distribu the spatial distribution of, of flow alteration um, and how that that relates to species richness uh, will be using particular regional case studies to, uh, to to sort of dig into that into some more detail to identify any of the relationships that, that might exist between flow alteration and, and species vulnerability um, and as I say developing case studies and so this is something which would clearly link closely to the the WWF um, free flowing rivers project and the kind of data that's coming out of that uh, the methodology for that is really based on the the, the assumption that that that, uh, that species do show this uh, this um, uh, adaptability to different um, uh, different conditions of flow um, and that can be quite complex um, and we, with the, the increasing amount of, uh, of, of hydrological models and species data that's coming out, then we, are, we, we have this greater capacity to be able to, to, to really sort of map this and analyze this in, in quite some detail. So the links to other, uh, other ongoing work is, um, is sort of quite extensive, potentially. Uh, um, integrating our work with other other research programs um, uh, wherever possible, um, integrating the work across the sustainable water future programs. So so looking at how these this this biodiversity work can integrate into things like the SDG working program, um, the environmental flows working program, and that kind of thing. Uh, the outputs obviously will have relevance to various convention um, targets, the CBD targets, assessing uh, changes in biodiversity, change in the ecosystem status for the Aichi targets, um, providing information to direct the Ramsar Convention. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and for the SDGs, of course, it's going to be particularly important for, uh, for the 15.1 and 15.5 <laughs> goals focused on, on freshwater biodiversity um, and, and, um, uh, and biodiversity loss, as well as uh, the 6.6 .6 goal um, looking at, at restoring freshwater ecosystems, which are, um, which are of course, important for providing services. Uh, the, the, the challenges that, um, that I don't have marked up there are um, that, that this is, this is um, highly dependent on, on funding. Uh, as I say, we've only, the, the, the group has been in existence for a year. We've put a couple of um, proposals in for the, the, the first program, the integrating um, uh, uh, remote sensing data with biodiversity data program, uh, particularly looking at how we can do that for for um, uh, mapping um, species distributions, biodiversity richness, and freshwater services, um, still waiting to hear on uh, on funding for that. The uh, the flow alteration program um, is it, we we is still kind of getting up and going, um, but as I say, it's kind of really this is this is contingent on on getting the the, the money we need to advance the work. Um, and hopefully that will uh, that that will that will pick up in the coming year. Now that we've had this kind of first year of really of, of SWFP, the Sustainable Water Future Program, just getting off the ground. Um, so uh, you can find more information about SWFP generally on, on the web if you just do a, a search for, for Sustainable Water Future Program. Um, I'm happy to to, uh, to respond to any questions you have. That's that's my email there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Next up, I'd like to invite Ian Jarvis to uh, introduce or talk about GeoGlam. Floor 
is yours. Thank you. I uh, I broke my glasses this weekend, so <laughs> I'll, I'll have to figure out how I'm going to do this. But it's it's a pleasure to be here. I, I better take this. Okay. Is that working? Very good. Um, okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I think we've seen from the presentations earlier today all the cross linkages between agriculture and water, water, food, energy nexus. It, it's clear that um, while we're not an integral part of your community, we're definitely well connected or should be. Um, as far as the mission, uh, we started off uh, in 2011 under France leadership in the G20 with a, a very strong policy mandate. Uh, around uh, improved information on agricultural production to reduce the volatility of commodity markets and support early warning is, uh, is something that we've added since then. Uh, the objectives are really to uh, strengthen the international community's capacity to produce, disseminate relevant, timely, and accurate information. It's a very broad uh, community. It's an open community. It came out of the community of practice within GEO for agriculture. Uh, it includes a uh, number of uh, agricultural ministries around the world, uh, academic institutions, space agencies, uh, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about methodology, but just to say that we bring together uh, the best available uh, science-based information with, uh, uh, from Earth observation satellites with human uh, intelligence and expertise on the ground to produce monthly uh, assessments of agricultural uh, production. Uh, the project governance structure, uh, we, as I said, we were, we are a community of practice. Uh, it's been fairly ad hoc actually up to now. Uh, and, but we're now seeing the demands of our user communities increasing to the point where we really find ourselves having to tighten up that, that uh, governance a bit. And it's going to become a little more formal, not because we like the bureaucracy, but because we feel it's needed to, to um, really address all the challenges we see before us. The map there shows the uh, global distribution of our activities. The green is the uh, Agricultural Market Information System Crop Monitor, or AMOS Crop Monitor, that was developed for the G20 uh, mandate. And the yellow is the one we've added in 2016, looking at early warning for food insecure nations. So together, it covers almost the entire world, although there are a few uh, smaller areas of gaps. Now, as far as achievements, there, there's many. As I said, it's a very broad community, but uh, I just wanted to focus on a, a few, and I'll probably get in trouble by not listing some, but uh, certainly the, the two crop monitors, the Early Warning Crop Monitor and the Amos Crop Monitor, are two of our flagship acti activities that I need to bring forward when we talk about uh, significant achievements. And these, these are truly operational. They're monthly. They're providing uh, information uh, for markets, information for food security agencies, that uh, is, I think is quite uh, universally seen as very valuable. Also bring up the joint experiments for crop assessment and monitoring. This has created a research plat a global research platform that has uh, attracted and supported f a lot of research funding from Europe and others. Uh, right now we're focusing on SAR with Canadian funding and so on. But it's, um, it's uh, truly uh, been a successful um, community that's brought, been brought together around the research. And we really are focused on the research to development to operational domain here. So you can't really have operational systems without strong research uh, underlying it. And finally, I want to highlight the Asian rice activity, which has been quite successful at monitoring um, rice uh, production in, in Asia. As far as um, the agenda going forward, uh, some of the deliverables we're going to be starting to work on um, we just finished our first five years. We're now looking forward to the next five years, and we, we're kind of changing up a bit. Um, we're, we're looking towards establishing more quantitative metrics. As I said right now, our, we bring the science-based information, but we also bring the human intelligence to create qualitative assessments largely. We're now trying to become more qualitative. And this is uh, allowing us to move beyond current uh, state monitoring to look at within season forecasts, but also uh, between season and over time. Our, our users really want us to get a handle on what's happening in terms of climate change to the agricultural production. So for that, we need quantitative measures over longer time periods than we uh, initially developed, as well as the type of information that's going to be required for the Sustainable Development Goals. 
We want to strengthen our transition from research to operations. We really want to accelerate the movement of our research activities through the operational application. Um, represent the observation needs of the community of practice and CIOS. We're re after our, our first five years, we're now revisiting our user requirements with CIOS next year. And uh, yep, yeah, and we'll uh, we'll be uh, refining those and retuning them for the for the future. Um, and on the infrastructure side, we're looking to develop more cloud-based, cube-based uh, infrastructure capabilities for uh, probably a spoken hub approach where we have centralized capacity for the com community at large and, and probably uh, develop uh, implementations um, where, wherever they're needed. Uh, provide uh, and also develop knowledge management systems to uh, manage all the productivity, the research productivity that we're creating. And probably the most important slide um, are links to uh, other SBAs or initiatives. And it's across the board. I've just highlighted a couple here, and these actually speak to Selma's presentation earlier. Uh, things like uh, looking at uh, surface soil moisture, evapotranspiration, uh, stress indices, these sort of things are things that we want to pursue. But as, as I've said already, you know, water quality and quantity, it cuts across the board. Um, the, the linkages between our communities. Contribution to the SDGs, we're focused on, on, the, on uh, the, the agriculture related SDGs, of course, but we know that we have uh, inputs into many of the others. Um, what we're finding, though, is the communication with the statistical, statistical community is a challenge, and uh, we need to break down that uh, challenge and work closer with the statistical community. You should be able to pronounce it first. <laughs> and uh, in order to, to uh, really bridge the gap between those two communities because uh, they're really the ones that are responsible for the SDGs and we want to be there helping them all the way. And I think this is something that's common for many, uh, many of us. And challenges and issues, uh, as I said, current state metrics are largely qualitative assessments of growing conditions based on science-based agroclimate and remote sensing and uh, and we need to move towards more quantitative measures and I think that's it so I should mention um, I'm currently with Agriculture Canada I have one foot in Geneva however I'll be moving to the Geo Secretariat to lead the GeoGlam initiative for the next couple of years so I can be reached until the 10th of November by that email and then I'll probably have a GeoSec email after that perhaps <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Next up, we have Harsh, uh, who's going to complete the trifecta of being a panelist, a chair, and now a speaker. Um, and Harsh usually has his own presentation, so we're going to have to figure out how to connect here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no worries. Uh, hope this works. I. Uh, We'll do the brave thing and actually try to see if I can show you things live. Uh, so very uh, quickly, one of the um, uh, things that I think we've all been discussing the last few days is uh, to see if uh, we can uh, get uh, one second. If we can get a more uh, a holistic, spatial uh, perspective of a lot of the stuff that we've been dealing with, uh, hopefully this works. If not, I will have to do a plan B. Uh, so, okay. yeah. it, it did before. Oh, it was. Okay. Uh, okay, it's back up again. All right. Uh, so uh, what uh, we are trying to do is to see if we can uh, promote more integrated spatial approaches where uh, it's not just the hydrologic cycle that we can estimate in terms of what's coming down, what's going off, and what's going to groundwater coming up, and so on, but also the fact that uh, a lot of the watersheds that we are working in all have uh, various users and various institutions associated with those users. And so as you have more and more uh, agencies associated with different parts of a 
uh, watershed, there's a need to try and see if information and, uh, and analytical tools can be the web that knits together a lot of the work that uh, is uh, happening in, in this type of a context. And this is at various scales, whether it's a transboundary river basin or a small little micro watershed. Uh, it's just different types of issues at different levels. But the challenge is to try and see if we can go from not just uh, to look at data and try to see where does this hammer fit in terms of which nail this can uh, hit, but in terms of trying to see what the challenges are. So suppose we are looking at uh, flood coping. Uh, we'll need some good knowledge in terms of early warning and recommendations about what to do. To do that, we need better information on the weather forecasting, the flow forecasting, and the uh, flood uh, uh, forecasting. For that, we'll need a lot of data on both the in situ and uh, bottom up and top down data set and ways of converting it from one to the other. So the challenge is to try and find all those decision uh, support type of uh, elements that are required by many of our clients and to see also what can be done at a retail level and what really could be done more at a wholesale uh, level in this uh, case. So if we can think about uh, how the wholesale folks can help the retail folks, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have the presentations sent around, to try and see uh, what we can do in terms of, uh, say, a lot of the entities that are gathered here or GeoGlows can help uh, each of the people in the countries, uh, for example, by providing platforms that they can use, or how the retail folks can help the wholesale folks in terms of trying to get better data for calibration, validation, and so on in this uh, regard. And uh, then to try and see if uh, you can help create systems in which uh, you can pull together a lot of the uh, the 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 the, the data from bottom-up uh, type uh, approaches, which are a lot of the in-situ measurements with the top-down satellite-based systems, and use the famous cloud services that we all talked about this morning to try and see if we can uh, go in and also do a lot of uh, uh, data processing, especially after we rescue the, a lot of the in-situ data, and uh, to try and see how these could then be disseminated in different platforms. So I'll quickly show you two platforms that we've been working on. One is something called Spatial Agent, which tries to pull together a lot of different data services in one uh, platform, which is an example of uh, a collaboration. And the second is a way of uh, packaging knowledge in uh, terms of uh, these ebooks. So a quick uh, minute on uh, each of these. One is Spatial Agent. It has a new look and feel now. Uh, we have a little bit of a Netflix thing going on now, where you can even <laughs> see, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you like these, you may also like some other sites that are out there. Uh, and uh, also a whole range of, uh, uh, of uh, data sets that are there from and, uh, from different data services that uh, are there from different sources. Just to give you a feel for some of these, uh, I'll just show you, uh, for example, uh, data related to, uh, let's say, uh, uh, country level. Uh, so if you are talking about just something like GDP per capita, to try and get a feel for, let's say, what was China in 1980, about $194 per capita, and now it's around $8,000 $8, per capita, versus Madagascar, which in 1980 used to be three times as rich as China, but unfortunately is now less than what it used to be with a lot of the conflicts and so on uh, that have taken the toll there. So uh, to try and get quick access to a lot of country level data as well as sub-national data sets. For example, a lot of the climate station data that uh, has been uh, pulled together by WMO from different places. Uh, and a lot of WMO agencies have uh, found a way to try and better display the 20,000 or so uh, station data that's out there globally. Uh, for example, this is from the Royal Netherlands Met Agency, for any station to try and find not only the averages, but also in terms of the entire time series on record uh, to try and uh, look at these uh, types of data sets, whether it be from 1853 or uh, right up till 2017, uh, you know, to try and uh, look at recent uh, data, or to uh, look at the evidence base for, say, is the temperature actually increasing or not in these stations and so on, these kinds of uh, data sets. In addition, a uh, lot of the, the clever work that all of you are doing, for example, to put a lot of Earth observation data in there. For example, in the last half an hour, how much rainfall have we had uh, in uh, since we this session began, or in the last three days, how much rainfall we've had? You know those kinds of things to try and uh, quickly look at these types of data. And uh, also, one last thing I'd like to show you is, in addition to the data sets themselves, to find ways of getting analytical platforms on there. So, for example, if you wanted to see uh, in the last uh, a few years uh, what uh, has been the NDVI as an example, right? Uh, so, to try and find ways in which you can calculate these live uh, using Google Earth Engine in this uh, particular case using their API. So within seconds, you can get 250 meter data or 30 meter data for the whole world. And uh, then uh, not only that, but also say I'm really interested uh, only in the Nile Delta and I really want to see just how the 
NDBI has been doing it uh, just for the Nile Delta level. Uh, so not only seeing the results of these kind of things spatially, where it's taking the last three or four years worth of daily data and uh, generating uh, NDVI averages for each of these uh, cells, but also to try and uh, look at these uh, in a time series, to try and see out of the 173 crops that are grown in the Nile Delta in two seasons every year, how has the NDVI been doing every year? And you can see, since it's an irrigated area with a big uh, Aswan Dam behind, there isn't much variation. But if you did this for some other place, it would be completely different. So we have a whole bunch of things that uh, we have in terms of showcasing a lot of cool data sets from around the world, uh, including, uh, say, for example, what a detailed DEM looks like, uh, let's say, in the Netherlands at every half meter by half meter, or to try and look at, uh, 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 say, the national water model, uh, uh, if uh, you wanted to uh, have a look at, uh, uh, say, something like this, which uh, shows what we heard this morning from uh, Tuscaloosa, a lot of the work that's been done in terms of the next 10 days uh, forecasts and so on, right? To try and uh, get quick access to a lot of these types of uh, data sets as you're looking at these. And the last uh, quick thing is to try and look at these uh, e-books, where uh, the idea is to try and find ways in which uh, a lot of the data services and analytical services can be packaged with other knowledge. This is an e-book that we've done with uh, the NASA folks, just to show you where you can integrate different types of videos and uh, show. And one last thing to show you is, in addition to uh, data on different services, being able to access uh, a lot of the data services interactively in e-books. So for example, if in Punjab they talk about, in India, groundwater going down, you can see what the GRACE data has to say about that and so on. So quickly visualizing a lot of these data and pulling these together. And we'll be happy to work with all of you in this regard. Uh, and uh, we've already heard about the high-level panel on water, and there's been a high-level panel on data as part of that, where uh, they've been uh, the bank has been helping facilitate working with Australia to try and get more harmonization in this space. And we're hoping that we can take it forward with the help of all of you. Thanks. Thank you, Harsh. magically works again for us. So last but not least among our speakers, I'd like to invite uh, Sushel Uninayar to come up here. And we will have hopefully close to 20 minutes left for discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Going off to Hash gives me a migraine, actually, because the slides are so good. <clears throat> in any case, I'm going to try and cover this in a very general, uh, general way. Um, as you know, there's 17 sustainable development goals. Each goal has several targets, and each target has several indicators. So there are several hundred of these, which, in theory, has to be monitored and reported on. So. For SDG 6, which is what I'm going to concentrate on, which is for clean water and sanitation, it's got various targets. And as you know, just by reading them, access and affordable water for all, first of all, you need to measure water availability. And so uh, Earth observations in this context, remote sensing, can be used to uh, estimate or actually measure various uh, components of that. Later on, I'll concentrate more on 6.6 and 6.3.2, because we had a little short-term pilot project with the UN environment. These are the indicators for target uh, six, for goal six. And there are various custodian agencies on the right-hand side. And 6.3 and 6.1, okay, yes. go back here. All right, these changes in extent, and that's one which is very readily measurable by uh, remote sensing. I'm gonna give you a few, few snapshots, which Harsh had much better versions of. This is a Landsat uh, uh, map, which is a, a population density derived from Landsat. And so what this shows is that you can take Landsat's classification, and with <coughs> suitable calibration and modeling, you can derive parameters such as population density, when you combine this with other, other variables, so socioeconomic, et cetera, you can determine water demand and water flows, water use. 
This is a uh, done by Nima, who's in the audience here. I'll come. I'll give the acknowledgments later on at the end. This is a water quality indicator 6.3, along with uh, this is looking at total suspended solids and uh, chlorophyll A. Anything which color the satellite can observe, and that's how this works. And there's also a time series, and the general idea here is to to come up with an estimate of water quality. And if there's an anomaly going on, you can then point to an efflux of nutrients or something into the water body and then go and determine what that is in terms of water resources management. This is, a, again, 6.6.1, an extent map. And this is a MODIS uh, 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 250 meter resolution uh, image. Left is a, is a reference period and the right shows 2015. We have supplied these to UNEP to establish baselines and some measure of variability. This is a similar thing we've done by University of Maryland group. We're using Landsat at 30 meters. And the right-hand side color-coded image shows the various, uh, within, within that period, 2000 to 2015, temporary water, temporary land, land to water, conversion or changes. The white water is the, is the permanent water bodies. This is done by NASA group, Lola and uh, David, um, looking at wetland, coastal wetlands and mangrove extent. And you can see from the, f the first one is, it's a part of a, a, a sorry, a, a, a seg part, part in Peru. The bottom one shows the changes from a reference base. And here they use Landsat and Sentinel-1 data and Sentinel-1C, which is a radar data set, and SRTM to give uh, canopy height estimates to identify the mangroves. Water efficiency indicators, there's precipitation, of course, the fundamental source of the water. And if you look at, the nap at its demand or the use, in this case it is agriculture, and between the two we can come up with an indicator looking at uh, the efficiency and order the change in, in the indicator showing that the methodology or the protocols used for water uh, for agricultural management in this case is improving or not. GRACE, we've heard about that, is a gravity anomaly satellite. And so this is, uh, has been shown to be quite useful in, 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 in uh, observing or measuring groundwater changes. <coughs> Two minutes, soil moisture, conclusions, and acknowledgments. <laughs> 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 so Arjik Kabata at NASA headquarters is the lead on this uh, STG project. The uh, MODIS um, analysis was done by uh, Alfred uh, Hubbard and Fred Pol uh, Fritz Policelli. The wetlands, mangroves, is by Lola Fatayanbo and um, David Lago Massino. The University of Maryland team is Amy Hudson and Matt Hansen. And Raha, who is here at the back, coordinated this on the Goddard side. Thank you. OK. Thank you. And thank you to all of the speakers uh, for your enormous discipline with your timing. We do, in fact, have 20 minutes left for discussion. Uh, I would actually like to invite all of the speakers to come up here. Since it's only 20 minutes, it'll be a lot quicker if we don't bring chairs up, if you don't mind just standing and, and fielding questions. So if all of our uh, speakers from this latest session, there's nine of you in total, wouldn't mind coming up here, um, I will take the chair's prerogative and ask the first question, because I was really struck by the short video that Angelica showed, uh, because that, that sort of spoke to me and uh, what CI does working with indigenous communities. And so a, a general question I have is, that's sort of a challenge that was put out there in terms of the scale at which the products that we can work on within GEO, are they suitable for that sort of more local scale? Uh, in situations where there's really a lack of technical capacity, they, they don't have trained hydrologists there, people to interpret the information, to what extent can the GEO community work with those communities that have a complete lack of technical information? And then also about the integration. They were talking about pink dolphins, but there are water quality issues, quantity issues. To what extent, and this is probably the first step, can we integrate the various water-related activities happening within GEO? 
So that question is to no one in particular. Uh, I was also reminded you have a lot of online fans, so we do have to be asking all questions in the mic and answering them with a mic. Um, I will pass this corded one to our uh, speakers all heard it in the corner there. <laughs> and uh, also thanks to Derek, now we have more chairs, so please come in and sit down, <laughs> because all of us are over here. <laughs> yes, uh, if you're standing in the back, please <laughs> grab a seat so, now. Uh, I'll just take a quick uh, crack at the question. I think the best way to at least get this started, there's no way to get one initiative to combine everything that everyone is doing and do it all through that one initiative. But what we can do is adopt common standards, whether it be OGC standards whether uh, for data, or whether it be uh, ways of doing open APIs and other things, uh, so that uh, then if all of us uh, throw it over the wall with all of the work that we are doing in common uh, uh, standards that can be reused in an analysis-ready format, then uh, what can happen is that very clever people based all over the world can find new ways to try and, and combine all of these and make portals and apps and uh, applications that uh, build on each other's data so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time and can build on each other's work. So an, a slightly different take on it. Um, a key word, I think, is, is information. And, and also, information does not necessarily need to be digital or distributed by digital means. We had an excellent example of that in terms of uh, we had a, a Geo Blue Planet Symposium a few months ago at my building in College Park, Maryland. And one of our colleagues gave a, a wonderful presentation. He was from Ghana and did fisheries management. And, and I won't go through all the details with you, but in terms of where he was in the university and then translated some of this um, from a scientific perspective into the locales. And they actually used flags in terms of to go out fishing if it was safe and the conditions of what was going to be expected, you know, red flag versus green flag. And so I think sometimes, particularly the scientists among us, we overthink things sometimes. And again, we, we said there's very pressing issues, lack of electricity in, in many areas, you know, lack of um, stable communications, although cell phones are kind of a global equalizer. But encourage folks not just to think about portals and cell phones and all that. Information comes about in a variety of different means. And so our job is translating the Earth observation data into information. And collectively, how can we do that? And again, not just through fancy portals and all that, which I do too. But um, so just some thoughts to think about. <clears throat> I think I would like to, uh, in a response, <clears throat> step ahead 10 or 20 years. And I think the answer is actually iPhone or Android, a smartphone. To do, in other words, an end user should be able to get a query responded to or answered. For that, you've got to take what Harsh has and build in the cloud a cognitive interface to the end user just like I think this has been done in medicine with IBM Watson. Now, something like that, where you can query, or even an expert or an end user can ask a question and get an answer. So everything else happens in the cloud. The analytics, the models, the remote sensing, data access happens in the cloud. So if you are in a village, whom are you going to ask this question? They have iPhones these days. They can ask the question through a phone. So that's the 20 year objective, I think, but the question is how do we get there? Okay. Uh, if no one else wants to respond to this, uh, we can open it up to questions from the floor. We only have one cordless mic, so I will be passing that around. I saw Rose first, so I'm going to go there. Uh, thank you. Just a quick one. Um, for the SDG um, the presenters that touched on SDGs, especially target 6.3, um, I think uh, looking at the UN uh, responsibles, there is quite a challenge on the methodology. And I think I see an opportunity for the EO to contribute to the monitoring process. What do you think from your side, especially your future, um, what do you think could be the good opportunity to engage the capacity of the UN to see the need for the EO? Because I don't think 6.3 has really integrated. I think 6.4 going on to 6.6, they've captured the, 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 the kind of uh, monitoring that we're talking about here. But not so much for 6.3. And they are struggling with this. Because a lot of what is there is monitoring the household waste, looking from that perspective. 
uh, but not so much from industrial waste and, and all these other sources of, of waste that is uh, affecting water quality. So perhaps just a, a quick uh, uh, insight into how this can be advanced because the methodologies now are being advanced and, and you know being taken to country level application. How do we ensure that this uh, contribution is actually embraced? Was that to me? Uh, yes, okay. yes. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Well, 6.3.2, I think, refers to water quality. <coughs> now, we've been working on a very on a pilot basis with UN Environment for a, for a, with just three countries on a pilot basis. And Nima here is, will be a better able to answer your question. But with the satellite, you can see chlorophyll A, you can see turbidity or total suspended solids. Now, it's a, so when there is a signal. You know that there's something going on, and then one has to interact, use that information at the local level to interact with state or local authorities to find out what, what's contaminating the water, what's causing an algal bloom or an excess uh, efflux of uh, sediment. So how does it work? How do you bring it to the countries? In, that, in this context, UNE, UN Environment, has is interacting with countries with workshops and things like that. So they're going to use the, the uh, prototype or pilot analysis which we have done at NASA, Goddard and NEMA in particular, to interact with the countries to see how they can bridge that link. NEMA, would you like to say anything more? Yeah, sure. Uh, Nima Palavan, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, so recently we've been uh, working on uh, developing a uh, near real-time tool uh, to, uh, to essentially detect anomalies in water quality condition, and that's based upon Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 uh, data. And, um, you know, we started uh, talking to end users across the country here and the U.S., and then uh, through this uh, UNEP support and, uh, from uh, headquarter, NASA headquarter, we have been sort of trying to engage, uh, we've been trying to engage end users in these three countries uh, to do some pilot projects to make sure that uh, essentially this anomaly detection tool is actually working and uh, whether the anomalies we're seeing from satellite are essentially uh, valid and precise enough and to help them with the decision making and um, to do hotspot uh, monitoring using this tool. It's just a proof of concept for now. We're we're having some issues with uh, processing online or near real-time processing of satellite data products, um, including Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2, but we're working towards it. We're looking for partners to help validate this tool uh, for different, in different nations and across the country here. I just wanted to make a, a, a quick point. So one, one of the things that's been coming up here is on sort of real-time data. And one of the, uh, just thinking about the, the biodiversity end of things, one of the big challenges for us is actually kind of, I think, matching that, that kind of, uh, that sort of supply of, of data that's, that, that we can update regularly. And, and um, so I, one of the things that I often hear is that, is, is, um, you know what? What's the data that we have that can be that, that can be used combined with other um, other water data variables um, that, that that can then lead to the kinds of decision making that we need need to do? And that is a real challenge for the biodiversity data because it's so difficult to get that information. Um, uh, so we have things like the, the, the IUCN Red List. We have um, the Living Planet Index. These things kind of taken a huge amount of time to to to, to compile. Um, <coughs> they're hugely useful, but they're, they're they're big things. So I think there are a couple of things that we need to do. And one of the things that's coming back to what you were saying, Derek, is like, well, how do you what 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 can we do at a regional scale that's going to kind of be immediately useful? How can we do something like a you know rapid assessment programs that we can get? Um, representative data that at least it's not it's not everything that we want but it's something that we can go in repeatedly and and, and kind of say well this gives us a this gives us a kind of a a, a measure at least and a measure that we can compare then to, to, to other remotely sensed um, information that we can then say well we can compare these two and use one as a proxy for another and so forth that is a challenge for us I think but it's something that we can do um, 
Uh, and I think then kind of looking at, at the, the kinds of opportunities for getting information that we haven't done already, the kinds of citizen science programs, is something that the Freshwater Bond Group have done in the past, is sort of mobilizing those data sources. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot of kind of um, input that we, the biodiversity community, community can get back from the other sort of water community in terms of what's the what's the information that we can deliver sort of repeatedly regularly that's going to be able to be most useful to help us kind of show what what ecosystem condition is that at, at the scale that, that that's useful that fits with these other these other um, data sources and I think you know for us to be bold in saying that like, we might not have the all the data we we need or at the level the precision level that we want but we certainly have something which is usable and we just have the caveats when we present it. Okay, more questions? Thank you. I am Victor Gutierrez from Temple University in Philadelphia. I am absolutely impressed with all the platforms and tools that you have developed. My question is also along the lines of what has been previously discussed. I like what you showed the process from uh, data to information to knowledge to decision making. Uh, my question is, uh, how is it possible to incorporate into all these capabilities, uh, let's say, a two-way process in which, uh, you know, uh, the recipients are not basically passive into uh, taking information and trying to interpret it and make decisions from it but actually participate in that knowledge production. I think it's a two-way process in which the practitioners should be more actively engaged. So I would like to hear a little bit of about it. Yeah, maybe just to get uh, started on that. Uh, that was the point I was trying to make with this wholesale retail thing, because the process has to go both ways uh, in that uh, thing. For example, you go to uh, now villages in many places with people with smartphones, will do a little Google search. That doesn't mean that uh, Google needs to be developed at the village level or the country level or the regional level and so on. A global platform is good enough, but it can be used at the individual level right, to try and do this. Similarly, on a lot of these kind of uh, data and uh, analytics, on some of these where it's just the laws of physics that have to work, uh, estimating NDVI and so on, there's no need to uh, replicate that capacity at every level. I keep saying it's like driving a car from point A to point B, a person driving the car doesn't need to know how the internal combustion engine works. You need other people. You need mechanics. You need people who develop new cars to worry about those. But there's a lot of the actual use that's made of a lot of these platforms has to be at the local uh, level. But also feedback on what kinds of uh, applications to even develop. What kind of uh, car do we need? What kind of uh, 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 kind of a new uh, application do we need? Has to come from uh, looking at uh, needs in different parts of the world and seeing if the economies of scale and combining them together and to make more uh, globalish platforms as uh, part of this. But uh, the big interaction that has to happen is first to make those products better, uh, which are global products now, by using a lot of the data for calibration, validation, and so on. But also, more important, to try and get the needs uh, about what kind of decisions are to be made at different levels to help uh, spur the actual uh, development and to help guide the actual platforms which are being developed over time. So uh, that's why you're right. It has to be a two-way process, at least. I think just a minor comment. Uh, <clears throat> what you're referring to, I think, is assuming that the end user can obtain the information. You're, you're suggesting, and I think validly, that the, there should be an interaction. So in the case of, let's go back to that uh, village in Colombia. Let's assume we can get to that village the information remote sensing based products or informa derived information which answers a question. In response, it would be very good to know how they use it and what, what uh, impact it had on their own local management. So that feedback going back to the remote sensing agencies could be quite useful in, cal in calibrating or validating their products. As Neem also said, for water quality, we don't really know when you're looking at a satellite whether what you, unless you have ground truth validation everywhere, we don't know how accurate it is. So that feedback would be quite useful. But going back further, I think there, there could be a whole, just like citizen science, the, the end users could be a part 
of the crowdsourcing, is that right? <laughs> okay, so that, that's the future model, I think. It takes a lot of, uh, it takes funding to do this, but what we have to realize is that we have about 20 or 30 billion dollars of space-based assets there, observing the Earth system continuously. So we need to optimize the delivery of information and products from that system, and we're not yet there in an e efficient way. Thanks, and, and this, I think one thing, it's an excellent question, it's really at the root of all this. I think one thing you've heard is there are going to be different mechanisms. One thing is getting back to the to the retail, wholesaler, retailer, I call it like the hub and the spoke. Um, and, but like one, for example, I run a, coast, a program in NOAA called NOAA Coast Watch Program, and we make available um, satellite data products for coastal oceans, global oceans, et cetera. But one thing is we have a staffed help desk for folks to email, to call, leave, and answer questions. So that's one example. I think the citizen science in terms of how you actually bring that in, it's easy to say the challenge is how do we do it, So, but that's definitely a venue. I think the third is, as Marie was getting to before someone else's, I think this is a lot of where the private sector is going to play a valuable role because you actually need there's only so much at an agency level for example that we can do or even the World Bank etc going into these areas and having these communications discussions with the users but I think this is where is an opportunity for private sector particularly that come up from those local you know jurisdictions to have those discussions to understand what is actually needed to tailor and tune the products that leverage these global EO capabilities from GEO, the agencies, participating organizations. So that's something I really hope to see in the future is helps make that connection. The direct communication discussion with the users is critical. And you know, pilot projects are great, but you know, it's gonna live or die, you know, in those face to face conversations. Okay. I'm looking at uh, Vanessa, who is not only a lead organizer of the morning, but is also Swiss, and I want to um, make sure we stay on time. We are just about at 12, and we will have another hour for discussion, so this is not cutting off discussion. Um, I don't. Do we have time to take any more questions, or can do I we need to move to the next a, session? Can I make a, just a, a follow-up to what Paul was saying? Because I was just going to ask that, or allude to that same question, or same point, which is that... Um, as uh, unseemly as it might be, at some point we have to monetize these data and these products. And that typically means in the private sector you have to close the business case. And so presently we, uh, environmentally concerned corporate America or corporate anyone, um, has to say how, what is the market? How much does it represent? What are the current opportunities? And where are the specific value-added services that private sector can actually monetize and sell to somebody? And so that question becomes to me is, um, we have got to go somewhere from this inferential, there's a $7 trillion water budget out in the world, down to that local buyer. So I have my question, I guess, to all of you is, who's willing to pay? You know, is it a few cents to get that, to get that uh, information to your cell phone? Uh, are you willing to pay for that? Are you willing to accept advertising? Is that is that unseemly to this group? You need to have a little advertisement to get your data, um, and then, you know, the, the going back to the the two way part is, um, you know, what are they? Are people willing? Are we willing to pay people rather than volunteers to make a little business? which is nice, right, to go out and make these measurements and sell them back to somebody. But that has to get kick-started with some kind of catalytic, catalytic kind of thing that says we're going to have to look at those business models and um, we can't co always compete with free. We cannot compete with free. Uh, your sustainability will never happen. So I think that was a great point. Thank you. I think we're going to transition now to uh, the last part of the agenda. Is that correct? Yes, yes, um, yeah, well, just oh, this. Two. Okay. I just, you know, you can talk, and I go to my email, and then n not everybody see my email, and I find the question, and then. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, no, no, no. no. Uh, let's do. Thing. No, no. Yeah. Let's do this, and yeah. then when yeah. we present. Okay. The While we sort this out, uh, just one more round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So. 
I just I just wanted to take this qu qu occasion just to quickly um, if any of you would like to try and get, would like to not try but like to give feedback on on your uh, perspectives on what's important for prioritizing efforts for for working on freshwater biodiversity science. Um, there is a survey that that was um, developed by uh, by IGB in, in in Germany, who are part of the SWFP group. Um, if you go to that, you can either use the Q code or go to that that link. Um, it would be particularly they they have tended to get a, a, a sort of a lot of 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 conservation biologists putting input in, and they want to kind of a or, or people whose primary focus is conservation. Biology, they want to get a, a, as broad an input as possible. Um, so please do feel free to to fill out that questionnaire. It only takes about ten minutes, um, uh, and it's it's oh, it's running through just to the end of this month. So that's so so if you do it before the end of this month, that would be that would be great.